Recording in progress. A call to order the Tuesday, July 25th, 2023, Town Council Committee will hold to order at 638. Roll call. Councilors present are Councilors Jones, uh, Franco, McBride, Bordelon, Westervelt, Melendez. There's a quorum of six. Calendar and communications, Councilor Franco. Um, I don't have anything to report tonight. Thank you very much. All right. Uh, Councilor Jones. Can you hear? You're not muted, so. I thank you, you, Mr. Mayor. Oh, yeah. um, nothing to report at this time. Thank you. Councilor McBride. <clears throat> thank you. Um, it's been a busy couple of weeks. I do have several items to report this evening. Um, numerous emails, um, you know, on many different matters, mostly to deal with the uh, property reuse committee I'm still receiving. I also participated in the State of Connecticut Deep Bottle Bill Advisory Group initial meeting. Uh, where we discussed recent changes such as the expansion of the various containers to the five cent deposit as well as discussions around the miniatures and nips and how those funds can be used also want to let everybody know that part of this meeting was indicated that as of january of 2024 the deposits will be going up to 10 cents so everybody should be aware of that i also want to inform everyone that the public safety committee that was had to, to be um rescheduled from tonight to next week uh, was an oversight we did not plan on having that meeting tonight uh, chief driscoll was not available so i apologize for not uh, for apologize for changing that but we moved it to next tuesday the first and it will be at 5 30. Uh, today i also attended a lunch and learn meeting and introduction to the new superintendent of the united states coast guard academy mark johnson uh, which was very interesting he talked about it, it he articulated his focus on the plans for the Coast Guard's involvement in the region and how he's going to move things forward uh, with, with various municipalities. So that was very encouraging. I also uh, participated and was involved in some STR discussions and meetings in Grant Long Point, and we're looking into how better to address this matter. I um, want to thank Town Manager Burt for sharing some of the information that, that he provided. Uh, it was very useful for the committee. I was also appointed to serve on the CCM Legislative Policy Committee regarding education, appropriations, tax, and finance. And I'll bring back information to the council as this committee moves forward. Lastly, at the last committee of the whole meeting, I attempted to see how the property reuse document could be further reviewed because it was extremely disheartening that this council did not consider or review the detailed work that the committee had done. As a result of that, I, as the past chair of the Property Reuse Committee, have drafted up and will be sending a letter to the full RTM to seek an RTM representative to bring to a vote of the full RTM an ordinance or resolution to the Town Council containing the fine-tuned 2023 Property Reuse document via the power of initiative as detailed in Section 4.5 of the Charter. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, it's good to be back. I received many communications regarding the properties committee document. Um, I also just want to restate that I sent a uh, inquiry to be part of the open vacancy on the public safety um, committee. I sent it to uh, the mayor and uh, the chair McBride. Um, I did receive communications asking when the council and who are we planning to uh, seat in the vacancy that has happened. Um, my answer to that was, I haven't heard anything. Uh, there's been no discussion. Um, I also received information about STRs, data centers, coastal access, November election, folks in the city asking, will it be two ballots or double-sided? Um, and let's see what else I have. I think that's pretty much it. I also attended the Always Home fundraiser. Um, this past weekend at the Mystic Shipyard, where they um, you pay a small fee to get in. They have live music, and they have it every year. They also have a silent auction and raffles available. Um, and Always Home uh, tries to help folks in our community prevent homelessness, as well as um, anyone who's experiencing homelessness. 
it was a nicely attended event, uh, great food, great conversation, and um, look forward to their next event. Um, they, if you're interested in getting involved with Always Home as uh, attending, if you go to their website, they have a lot of different uh, community outreach events where they fundraise throughout the year. Um, I think that is all I have on my list. Thank you. Thank you, Council Westerville. Thank you very much. I received uh, a lot of different uh, phone calls and communications regarding the property reuse committee, as well as the power of initiative that Councilor McBride was speaking of. And just want to say that I wholeheartedly support that so that it gets a fair shake. Thank you. Thank you. On to the approval of minutes, July 11, 2023. I make a motion to move the July 11, 2023 committee, the whole meeting minutes so moved. Second, Franco. Moved by Melendez, seconded by Franco. Seeing no discussion, I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions, carries unanimously. Six in favor, zero opposed, zero abstaining. Councilor Jones, can you hear us all right? Uh, it's pretty much like you're underwater. Okay. I'm hearing like every other word. All right, so we'll have GMT's VC what they can do. On to new business, Groton Age Friendly Plan. Patrick, I can hear you. That was pretty clear. I'm Mary Jo Riley from Thrive 55 Plus, and this is Tabitha, Tabitha Wilson. Tabitha Wilson from um, OPTS, the city's, the town's um, planning and development department. And um, you received in your packet the community action plan for our age-friendly Groton plan. This age-friendly communities is part of the AARP and um, we would be one of very few in the state of Connecticut to have that designation. And part of it is that we had to come up with an action plan for this. So um, we have 
done this as a town and city collaboration and we work with the planning department in the city and um, it really is partly information sharing and grant opportunities that we're able to look for. Our committee members not only included Tabitha and myself, but Kathy Chase, who's an RTM member and a town of Groton resident, and Sierra Patrick from the city, and Beverly Washington, who was a RTM member, but now she's on the Board of Education, and she is a town of Groton resident. So our committee um, comes with, with us, we come with a good deal of experience in planning for seniors and people of all ages. So each age-friendly community has to come up with a community assessment and an action plan within two years of designation. So for us, it's October of 2023. The plan is meant to account for ongoing programs and for projects which might be eligible for fitting into this age-friendly community plan. It's not meant to create new work or new expenses. Uh, it really what it does is it pulls together what we're doing around town from all the different departments into an action plan. Additionally, there are technical assistance opportunities that we can get from AARP as part of this, and also the grant opportunities. AARP has a community challenge grant every year where they distribute millions of dollars nationwide, um, and Mary Jo has already gotten some of those funds. Yeah, this year um, we had lost, during COVID actually, on 30 trees on the property at Thrive 55, and we were able to replace 10 of them through an AARP grant. The community profile, um, they have eight areas that are looked at, including housing, open space, how people get around town. It's not just when you think of transportation. It includes walking, biking, trails, the population and the demographics, the health of the community and what, where the access to health is, work and civic environment, respect and social inclusion and communication. The concept is you're promoting quality of life measures that benefit all ages. So we're looking at all aspects of quality of life um, and measuring that against the information we have. And a lot of what, as Mary Jo has mentioned, a lot of this work doubles up on work that's being done in other plan, planning projects. So for example, our plan of um, open space and conservation that we're coming up on a, um, an update for, this will feed into that and these, these policies and ideas will help um, endorse that plan. And the same with the Parks and Rec Department, we are working on a master plan and the master plan includes trails and what we're doing with the parks and keeping up the environment. So this is where all these get pulled together to give us this age-friendly designation. So the outreach process to set the goals was we did meet monthly as a group discussed what we wanted to do and what directions we knew were going on around town. The project, um, we also had on Greater Groton a survey so we could get feedback from the community. It was uh, 20 questions, very detailed survey. We did a public workshop to gather feedback in June of 22 and also posted on YouTube we did a very active drop-in event at Thrive 55, um, and we gathered a lot of feedback, not only from the older adults, but from other community members who happened to be within the building at other programs. We kind of encouraged them to come read and give us feedback. And we feel that we will do continual feedback as we progress through the plan. 
as Mary Jo describes, we did the two-year process of ongoing feedback iterations. So um, it also did include the city. Sierra Patrick is on our committee, um, and it was distributed to Groton Long Point and no, no Inc. as well. For AARP, there's the eight domains of livability. So our plan does address each of these areas, and they're listed below on this slide. <coughs> And this is what every town would be looking at if they were applying to be an age-friendly community. So we have quite a robust um, implementation goal matrix that's in the plan itself, but we wanted to just briefly put on the slide um, under each of our eight categories that Mary Jo described, the primary goals um, for those categories. So under housing, we have provide more opportunity for seniors to remain in their homes and other dwellings. So that includes things like doing a best practice guide for upgrading your house um, to, you know, live on, on a easier, see, more senior friendly, <laughs> more senior, senior friendly. friendly adaptations. Helping them with housing. Um, what do they need for fall prevention so that they're not at risk for falling at home, like grab bars, lighting, getting rid of throw carpets, um, but also um, making housing available. That's one of the things in our community, and it's not only our community, but many communities in the state is that there's not enough housing for people, and we have people that are trying to downsize, and there's no place for them to downsize to. So looking at that, and that's where planning would be looking at. So as we're seeing the trends of people are less, less people are having children, less children are being born and more people are aging over 65. So the need for housing for seniors is, is higher than ever. The outdoor spaces and buildings is really just the access to the outdoors. We found during COVID, especially that that's where people went was outdoors. They could visit people. They felt safer out there, and now they like to be outdoors, and we want to make sure that the outdoors is accessible for them, that there's bathrooms available, that there's benches for people to sit on that maybe can't walk as far as other people, um, that sidewalks are available for those that maybe are in wheelchairs or using walkers, um, and that's all ages. It's not just older adults that use walkers or wheelchairs. So we're looking to make sure that's available. Transportation is a difficult one, but providing at least the information of what services are out there so people can get around town and get to where they need to go. And on the transportation note, I will say we talked a lot about sidewalks and connectivity of sidewalks because it is a mode of transportation to get around my foot, and that's how a lot of seniors would like to get around, um, and especially working with the city, you know, how can we work together to create that sidewalk network? Social participation is creating opportunities for people to connect to each other. Mm -hmm. This is where Parks and Recreation does a lot of programming. Um, just in the Senior Center, we have our holiday event, we do our Super Bowl event. That's not just meant for seniors, that's meant for the community. The um, Art with a Purpose program, the Chili Cook-Off and the Baker's Battle, those kind of events bring people in to Thrive 55, expose people to what we do, but also provide something, a place for the community to connect with each other. And that's part of what Parks and Recreation does. We also encourage volunteerism. Currently at the Senior Center, we have over 150 volunteers. Um, they're putting in about 1,000 hours a month, and um, they're doing anywhere from helping teach programs to growing vegetables for our kitchen to um, meeting and greeting people at the door. So it's, it's an important way for people to connect. Then a couple others, so community health services, um, providing access to affordable health care and fitness activities. Clearly Thrive 55 is doing a lot of programming on that side as well, um, providing a, a health services coordinator, for example, um, 
the work in civic environment goals, increasing opportunities to engage with civic and community activities and access work and volunteer opportunities. Um, we talked about creating more listservs and opportunity, um, listing opportunities for people to find that information, as well as potentially having a community-wide calendar that's shared with the city and the town that people can go to one place and find out what's going on. Um, that was a really popular idea. And then finally, oh, actually, I can't see the bottom. But <laughs> Respect and social inclusion goals, you know, really trying to beef up the um, inclusion of the language and the representation of our <coughs> black and indigenous people of color in, in all of our work. And then also um, the LGBTQ plus, um, you know, always making it clear that these folks are included and, and wanted at all of our events. Um, and then communication and engagement, again, as I said, uh, th one of the ideas was to have a big a calendar for everyone, <laughs> um, but also just getting practices to get things on social media and on, on the web and in person and just having more drop-in events and thinking through ways that we can engage in a more inclusive manner. So each of our categories has a set of goals, a set of actions, and implementation steps that we are working towards. Um, and here it gives a sample of housing. The goal is to provide more opportunities for seniors to remain in their homes and other dwellings in Groton. And it's just creating those relationships with the housing authority and other groups that can assist seniors in maintaining and staying in their home. People want to age in place. They like Groton. They want to live in Groton. And it's providing the services and the support for them to stay in Groton. So the plan does outline in a number of pages all those goals and action steps as well. So our next steps, um, as Mary Jo said, we are looking for your endorsement on this plan so that we can bring it back to ARP and submit it and be officially um, done with our, our required steps to be an age-friendly community. Um, and then we'll join our friends in Cheshire, Fairfield, Glastonbury, Greenwich, and Newtown, um, who are also age-friendly communities. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. So I'll make a motion to recommend a resolution to accept the Groton Age Friendly Plan for the Town of Groton. So moved. Second. Second. Moved by Melendez, seconded by Bordelon. Thank you. Thank you for that presentation. Council Bordelon. Uh, thank you. Um, thank you so much for this presentation. It's, it's extremely important to make sure that we have programs here for people um, when they come in and they're young and utilizing our schools, but also as, like you stated, as they age. And definitely that's been a big concern that I've heard from the community, especially on the housing piece. Uh, you know, one lady approached me um, and stated like a lot of senior housing, some don't accept pets. And it was hard for her to like downsize because she couldn't find a place that would allow her dog to go. And I. Never even thought about that as a concern of downsizing um, for the elderly, and um, so there's a lot of concerns out there that you know, and you know, eventually she found something in another town. Um, but it, it is important that if folks have lived here their whole life, that they can find and have the resources to stay in the town where they were. Um, I appreciate you know um, the outreach aspect, and I think it's really important to have. Um, you know, the goals and objectives that are outlined here, which are going to help serve our community. So I commend you for those efforts. Under the one line, uh, just a thought that came to mind where you, um, the, I don't have that the slide you guys did because it wasn't in our packet. I just have the, the overview. But the slide where it kind of caught off at the bottom and it, where it talked about being inclusive, um, maybe adding a line also for folks with disabilities under there. You don't have to. Just another way to make that sound a little bit more inclusive. So you brought up in the, the racial background and the other ethnicities and the LBGT, but a lot of folks um, that are senior, some have a disability prior to becoming a senior. And, and that might be another way to just, a little word, smithing might be nice if, if you feel so. Um, no, I appreciate that. Yeah, and that would just close out that whole inclusion line. 
Um, other than that, I read through everything else um, you know, pretty that we had in our packet. I'd love if uh, the town manager, if you could send us a slideshow as well. It's just good to have for future if someone asks questions about it, it'd be nice to just reference it in my email. But um, who wouldn't want a program like this? I mean, it, it's a no-brainer to me, and it, it just instills you know, our, our commitment to our community from start to finish. So I commend everybody that was involved in the work and effort that they've done. And I look forward to seeing this uh, come to fruition. And um, thank you for your hard work. Councilor McBride. Yeah, just a quick comment. Great presentation. I can tell a lot of work went into it. So thank you for all your efforts. I just had a question on the AARP piece. It talks about, it, it's categorized as Mystic, Connecticut. But then in the detail, it talks about the population of 38,000, the, the yeah. map of Groton. Is, is it Mystic, all no. this detail, or this is all of Groton, although it's categorized as Mystic? So, yeah, ARP for some reason labeled it Mystic. Okay, but it is. It, it's the, the town of Groton it, that applies, that yeah. okay. as indicated by the map in there. It's Perfect. Okay, that's all. I just a question for clarification. Thank you, Ian. Councilor Jones. Well, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Um, very nice presentation. Um, can you just talk a little bit about how you develop these goals? And then the second part of the question is, there are other programs that we have going on, um, the, the planning goals and those kind of things. Are, are, were they adjusted to kind of fit into those goals or are these AARP goals or just sort of where did they come from? The categories came from AARP and what we did was um, we went to the community, looked for what they, what they saw under each category as a need and then we also looked at what other departments were already doing and already planning. So uh, one of the, during this time, one of the things that happened was a walkability study was done. And so seniors from our walking program participated in the walkability study who therefore could come back to us and let us know what should we be putting into this plan to help with that part of transportation. So we did a lot of different ways of doing focus groups and tried to reach out to beyond seniors and talk to other people in the community. Yeah, no, I would commend you. I think it's, they're very nice goals and they fit for just a you know, much wider range than just senior citizens. Oh, yeah. I think they fit for you know, all citizens. Seems to be a nice balance of uh, different, different goals and ideas, so. Um, no, I like it a lot. Thank you. Thank you a lot. And it's nice that you did all that work to kind of match up with other efforts that are being that are going on in the town and to try to make it you know, as wholesome and complete as we can. So thank you. Thank you. Council Portalon. Um, just one other piece. When you talked about the walkability, um, something else came to mind after I spoke is, you know, I, I think of like the senior section of Brantford Manor which has the low income housing, but also has the low income for seniors. And you know, one of the things that has come up time and time again is walking out of there, there's really no sidewalks to head towards the beach. You know, you can't leave Brantford Manor uh, and head uh, you know, the opposite way. And, and even to the right, I think the sidewalk ends too. So it is very, very important to have connectability. And that seems like a little bit of an oasis uh, where if a person has a disability or identifies as having, you know, with a walker or maybe they have a seeing eye dog, there's, there's, you know, there's only a roadway there. So they are, they're, they're stuck. And, you know, I don't feel comfortable some days walking on it myself. So imagine if you had some other impairments. Um, so definitely, definitely a focal point that I thought of um, when, when, when talking about that. And I was thinking about where the housing is located for our seniors. Uh, Paquanic Village over by the Shell gas station down on Paquanic Road. I see a lot of folks walking from the housing over there. Very, very convenient, very centrally located to shopping and walking and the busway. Um, but, it, you know, I, I thought about the one in Brantford as being an outlier um, and not having sidewalks, uh, even for the children getting out of that complex as well. Also, again, under that, um, the, the line that I had brought up adding the, um, folks with disabilities. Uh, another way to word that or the way we do it, you know, and once again, it's just a suggestion. You don't have to use it, but also maybe to add that you're also, you know, open into a broad uh, tapestry of, of, of income uh, base. Because some people feel very um, 
it's one of the things that people feel judged on is that, well, we don't make as much as the other people. So that income disparity. So something in there saying that you're inclusive to all income backgrounds and, you know, so you got the diversity, you got the LBGTQ, you got the disabilities, and you got that diversity of incomes. Mm -hmm. um, I think that would just make some more people maybe feel a little bit more welcome. Um, my other thought is, and again, I, I, I didn't have that slideshow with me and I didn't read as much as I could off of here, um, but also one of the things is, um, and maybe you did address it, is uh, food insecurity. Was that addressed any, anywhere in here? Because seniors overwhelmingly suffer on low income um, and accessibility to fresh food and affordable food. And I know you guys do a wonderful job with providing meals at the center, but I don't know if that was highlighted in this thing that you're gonna present. That's my question. Yeah, it was one of the areas we did discuss. Yeah, we um, and, and it's one of the areas the programmers at the center are working on. Um, we do a Just Pick program, which is working with the uh, Connecticut Community Gardens Association, and they do a farm share. So um, we were able to expand that program to 70 people this year, um, where every week they get a bag of fresh vegetables, and we really select the people that are food insecure for this program. But then we also get Yukon co-op chefs to come in and teach people how to cook and prepare. Because sometimes people, yeah, you can have the fresh vegetables, but they don't know how to prepare them. Or they think kale, what am I gonna make with kale? I don't like kale. But they may try some of the samples of what these chefs do and say, yeah, you know, actually that's not too bad. So we are working on trying to address some of that food insecurity. So I'm not sure if it was in the slide. I don't know if that's another bullet point you may want to add is that you guys are addressing those food insecurities or attempting yeah. to try to. It, it um, is really part of the health section of this where um, you know people think of medical health. Right. They don't think of exercise, nutrition, stress management, yeah. but that's all part of it. Perfect, yeah, adding that would be helpful. And you brought up the point about how to make it. You know, my, I, it's a great point is, uh, you know, my friend's grandfather, you know, their grandmother passed and she did all the cooking. It was generational and he just doesn't know how to prepare things. Like, it's just the time. So having that, that program is wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Councilor Franco. Thank you. I had read this um, earlier and um, there were so many different aspects of things within our community um, from trying to create relationships with Grunt and Housing Authority, um, modifying our zoning regulations, um, as you said, trying to help people age in place. I think it's important. Um, also continuing like your travel, um, offer traveling outdoor activity groups for seniors, improving the maintenance of our existing parks and open space. Um, also supporting the creation of new outdoor places to gather, recreate, and socialize. Walking paths, benches, wayfinding signs are very important as well because not everybody knows how to use GPS on their phone. Um, street trees and seating, for shaded seating areas for people. Um, location signs, connected sidewalks, which there's a need throughout our town for those. Handicap accessibility to town properties. Um, there was so many other things. There's a call and connect where volunteers address calls from seniors for, through an anonymous hub. Marketing for events. I mean, there was just, and these are just a few that I'm, I'm picking out, but the pages go on and on of all these wonderful suggestions that I found in here. Um, so one of the questions I have, so you're saying if you um, apply or submit this through our, um, AARP, that this will make it so that you are more eligible for other grants. Is that what you're trying to say? Yes. There, there is that opportunity. There is a national AARP Community Challenge Grant, which is larger funding. And the one that we received for the trees was from the Connecticut branch. And that's smaller funding, but they're looking to see that you're trying to be an age-friendly community when you're applying for these grants. And I would also say that for our uh, plan of conservation and development and for the climate action planning, um, they're really looking to hit those marks as well as the same kinds of things. So when we were developing these action 
steps and listening to feedback. We were thinking about how it would feed into those plans as well. Right. Right, because there's there's plenty in here through transportation, social participation, which is huge. Um, and where they're saying that maybe we should have more farmers and artists in markets all summer long. And um, providing year-round concerts, um, maybe ones that start at like five o'clock on a Tuesday, so they're not in the evening. And um, I think that would be wonderful at different locations that they don't all have to be down at Esker Point Beach, just say, you know, that you, maybe you could have some, I've noticed you've had them at the C, um, Thrive 55, and we've shown up on Tuesdays and they're out in the parking lot. And I, I was thrilled to see such engagement by the community coming out and sitting and watching these concerts with a DJ maybe even or something. It was, it was just awesome. Um, and then the health services, work in civic environment, communication and information, respect and social inclusion. I think these are all wonderful. I think whoever was on your committee that you had listed did a wonderful job with you. And um, thank you to everybody who participated. I think it's a wonderful document. And these are things that we should as the community strive for just for everybody to have a great place to live in Groton. So I thank you very much, and I would absolutely be supporting this. Thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? Okay, seeing none, I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, abstentions, cares unanimously. Six in favor, zero opposed, zero abstaining. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Thank you. All right, on to Committee of the Whole 2023 meeting schedule. So I'll just, this is very simple. When we were doing our schedule last year, Councilor made a, an amendment request um, believing that the, let me get here, let me get my dates straight. Believing that the municipal primary was on August uh, 8th, so we moved uh, our August 8th meeting to August 7th, but in reality, uh, it's on September 12th, so we should move September 12th to September 11th, or at least that's what we typically do. We typically move the day that corresponds with the primary to before the primary, um, so the council, if they wish, can do that. And there's also the other option to move that August 7th back to August 8th because there is no primary on August 8th. So that's sort of uh, the background. So I don't know if anybody has any questions about that. Well, first I'll make a motion. So I will make a motion to move the September 12th, 2023 Cal meeting to September 11th, 2023 and move the August 7th, 2023 meeting to August 8th, 2023. So move. Second. Moved by Melendez and seconded by Bordelon. Okay, seeing no discussion, I'll call for a vote. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, <coughs> abstentions. Carries unanimously, six in favor, zero opposed, zero abstaining. On to the community policing update. Uh, good evening, Council. Welcome. Well, thanks for having us. Um, I'll make some introductions in a minute, but do you have any questions before I get started or just uh, go through with the update? Yeah, just we'll start. All right, great. Well, um, joining me here at the table is Sergeant Rich Sawyer. Uh, Officer Heather McClellan, you've probably never heard of Chase, but this is, uh, I say that tongue in cheek, but this is Chase, who I, I'm sure everybody's familiar with. Um, and we've got some folks in the back of the room that I wanna introduce. Um, um, they kind of fall under our community policing umbrella. Um, so I think you've 
been introduced. If you'll just step up to the front, uh, both of you, for a moment, so I think that you can probably get on the camera so that the public can see you. But we've got uh, Lorena Clark, who's been with us just over a year as a uh, public safety community outreach specialist. And we also have Maria Knott. So maybe you guys can stand in front of that camera so they can, the public can see a little bit. But um, um, Maria just joined us last week. She's, she's getting our feet, her feet wet, uh, providing some training. Met some, uh, some folks, met Community Speaks Out today, you guys, right? And uh, so they're our community outreach specialist, been doing a lot of great work for us. Uh, I know you'll get to meet them more in the community as uh, they move forward and doing their duties. Uh, I, I told them when we were out in the hallway a little while ago that these are the folks you need to thank because they're the ones that supported these positions and funded these positions along with the RTM. Uh, it's been a great program for us, and I know they're doing great things now, and we'll continue to do great things in the future. So, uh, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for all, all you right. do. And they've had a long day, so if you don't have any questions for them, I'm going to let them go home. Absolutely. <laughs> all right. Thank so you. Thanks for joining us, guys. Can I? Um, just to give you some background on where we are with our community policing program. Uh, so our department has had a, a rich history with community policing. Um, when I arrived here as chief of police in 2015, um, because of staffing shortages, budget cuts, really our community policing program was defunct. Uh, we've always had a community policing approach to our duties that we've used, you know, the community policing model. But at the time, the only vestige of that that was left was, was ownership patrols. Our officers did take that community-oriented philosophy out to their duties every day. Um, but, but the program itself had, had kind of fallen by the wayside. In the years past, we had dedicated networking offices. We had a place in Pequannock Bridge uh, where TVCCA is now. We had a place in Navy Housing. We had a place in downtown Mystic. Those are networking offices. Uh, but they, they went away prior to my arrival. And we've reconstituted that, certainly with your support and the support of the RTM. Uh, about five years ago, we got our first, uh, our, our, our most recent incarnation of community policing officers when uh, now Detective Rich Savino uh, was in that position. Uh, when he left and was promoted, Heather McClellan took over, and uh, the rest is history, as they say. Um, Heather's done an outstanding job. I know that you've, you've seen her at community events and certainly is involved in so many things in the town, and I'll ask her to expound on that in a little bit. Uh, and uh, real proud of the work she does with, with Chase. Uh, the one person that operates behind the scenes that not many people know about is Sergeant Rich Sawyer. Rich uh, is the community policing supervisor, but this is one of many duties of his. Uh, he is also in charge of training. Uh, so all of the training that the department does, keeping track of the records, making sure people stay updated with their certifications, the ancillary training, firearms, all that stuff falls under him. He orchestrates all that. But in addition to that, he's also responsible for hiring our new employees. All the police officers that come into the department, he facilitates the hiring process, um, if, uh, you know, sets up the background investigations, all the pre-hiring screening that they're required to do as um, state certified police officers in order to get hired. Rich takes care of that. So um, Rich has a pretty robust day when he shows up. He's got a lot on his plate. Uh, fortunately, we've got some great people in the community policing positions that don't need a lot of direction and guidance. They're pretty much self-starters. Um, unfortunately, and I don't, I don't know if he will show up or not, but Sharif Afifi, when this was scheduled, he had a pre-approved vacation plan. So he's traveling back and had hoped that he might make it by the end of the meeting, but I don't see him. And, um, my guess is maybe the traffic wasn't that accommodating, but Sharif Afifi started uh, a couple of weeks ago in this position. He's, he's done a lot of great work already. Um, that's the second funded position, and, and frankly, it's taken us a little while to get there because of staffing shortages. It was a high turnover rate. A lot of people retired. I know I've talked to the, uh, the council about that during uh, budget time, but we are, as we sit here today, we're, our staffing is at 100% in the police. We're still short on dispatchers. Um, it just lost a uh, civilian member that was in records for, for um, things that were behind our control and certainly hers, but we'll be filling that position soon too. Um, so the real missions, as I, I indicated, is to network and work with the community for better policing strategies, but also to develop a connection with the community and making sure that when we have trust and, and partnership with the community itself, with businesses, with citizens, uh, that we can do a better and more effective job of policing. Uh, so as I indicated before, in the past we had a, uh, a dedicated office in Pequannock Bridge. Uh, now we've got a networking office that's kind of split. It was in the community center. Heather really operates uh, a lot out of the library. 
I've also uh, spoken with Jen Mealy from the library. We're going to have office hours for the community outreach specialists to be there on a regular basis to meet with members of the community uh, on their terms and at their times. We had an office in, in Navy housing. Uh, as you probably assume, we have a good connection with the Navy community here in town. And I'm going to ask uh, Sergeant Sawyer to speak about that a little bit, particularly with some of the things that we do post-incident, particularly with domestic violence. He'll, he'll bring that up in a moment. Um, the commercial district, which I, you know, is around Groton Square, that area, we do not currently have a community policing networking office, although a couple of weeks ago I was in discussions with um, uh, the new owners of the Groton Motor Inn that are looking to work with us and potentially give an office space there for community policing, which, which uh, sounds promising and, and there's more to, there's much more work that needs to be done before we finalize anything like that, but that is uh, a potential uh, location for us to have a, a little substation out there, which I think would be good. That area of town has different needs than other areas of town. Our officers investigate a lot of larcenies, shopliftings, uh, motor vehicle accidents. It's a busy area of town that has different needs. Uh, and currently the Mystic Community Policing Substation uh, located on Water Street is in the process of being renovated. And I think you had told me that they were pretty, uh, one of you told me today that their uh, public works is over there working on it as we speak, right? Correct, they're painting it today. So we, we've been working with OPDS on that because they have some ideas for downtown Mystic that we can work with them on uh, when it comes to the, uh, uh, that facility. And then the final component of this are the schools. The school's certainly a big partner with us. Uh, one of Heather's additional duties is she teaches DARE. We have another officer that assists with teaching DARE, but we also have two school resource officers. Uh, during the summer months, there are patrol assignments, so neither one of them with us tonight. Uh, but at uh, Fitch High School, that's Officer Scott Bousquet, and I, at uh, Groton Middle School, it's going to be for this upcoming school year, uh, Officer Greg Hunter. Um, and then in addition to them, we do have three uh, community service officers. As you'll recall, those are civilian employees. They're part-time hourly employees, and they do some work in the police department. They'll assist with fingerprinting. They'll assist uh, with some duties inside. Uh, and we've also used them quite a bit for uh, issuing traffic, uh, issuing uh, parking tickets uh, for parking violators in different parts of town and primarily in, in downtown Mystic. Um, some of the highlights uh, before I turn it over to my uh, colleagues here is that uh, uh, she, she probably will not be happy for me bringing this up again, but uh, community policing officer Heather McClellan received an award uh, from the Attorney General of the United States last month uh, for distinguished service in community policing. So that, you know, I'm, I'm extremely proud of her work. And that's, uh, as much as I'd like to give her credit, it's really Chase, that's the brains behind the outfit. You know, Bree, uh, Chase is out there uh, working hard every day and, and dragging Heather along with her. Um, but no, we're, I, I say that tongue in cheek, but we're really proud of your work. And, and um, that was a national award that was bestowed upon Heather in, in this department. So we're really happy about that. We've also enhanced foot patrols. So th that is something that's been, uh, uh, requested and that we try to uh, we try to field as often as possible during the summer months particularly when it's when it's busy we try to get officers out um, into the downtown mystic area during winter months we do some directed patrols at some of the establishments you know retail sales where there's more shoplifting and that's along the route 12 corridor so we'll have directed patrols for people uh, beyond beyond just the community policing officer those are generally uh, patrol officers that we put on special assignments for that we also utilize a traffic unit, uh, and that's something that's also being reconstituted in years past, and, and this did happen under my tenure. We would have dedicated uh, assigned officer that would go out, and they do just strictly traffic enforcement in hot spots. Uh, right now, the, uh, the supervisor that oversees that is Lieutenant Lenda, so what he does is he delegates certain areas to certain officers to do traffic enforcement at, at particular times of the day when staffing allows. And we also have our Marine unit, uh, unit um, that has been staffed on the weekends, particularly during these summer months when we have a lot of maritime traffic around, in and around uh, Groton from the Thames River to the Mystic River. So they'll be out on patrol, uh, assisting stranded motorists, assisting with you know, violators, unsafe boating practices, uh, BUI enforcement, boating under the influence, and they're out on the weekends as well. Uh, uh, Heather, uh, Officer McClellan, excuse me, runs our social media accounts, so she gets involved with uh, Facebook, our Facebook postings, but also uh, recently, and maybe you can just hit this real quick, but Ring 
uh, the neighbor's account. Maybe you can explain what that is and what we're doing with that. Sure. Um, so for anyone that has home surveillance, uh, whether it be Ring, Arlo, anything like that, there's a, a program that allows for sharing of, of those uh, videos, um, both to your neighbors, if you're a part of this network, uh, or for the, the police department. Um, so for us, it gives us an opportunity to really just something happens, we can tap into uh, the neighbors and, and see if there's video footage that, that can help with a case that we have going on almost immediately. Um, and I think for uh, citizens, it, it allows for folks to feel empowered to, to be able to help each other out, understand the, the needs of, of their certain neighborhood, and, and maybe um, you know, be a little bit more proactive if, if there are things that are going on with their neighbors. So it's been, uh, it's been very helpful so far. You know, an important outreach that we try to do, and like I said, Heather and a couple others participate in it, is just providing information uh, through social media. We don't have anybody dedicated to that, so usually it's something that happens, you know, if we put out a news release, it'll get posted on our social media account. If there's big events that are happening, like next week, we've got National Light Out on the f on the 1st from 5 to 8 at, at uh, Poquantic Plains, in case uh, anyone wants to attend. That's all put out on social media and some good news stories, but also, some, you know, make arrests, the significant incidents that happen in town, we try to put that on. Not monitored 24-7, um, so there is a caveat on there. If, if people need police services, they should not be going through Facebook. They should be calling the police department if it's an emergency 911 or if it's a routine incident that needs to be investigated, and they call our, our routine number at 860-441-6712. Um, and a, a lot of other things that we've been doing, and, and I'm going to going to give uh, some folks here some some time to speak and, and answer any questions, but we have a, uh, a Citizen Police Academy. We were hoping to run it last spring uh, through some reasons internally with, with staffing and whatnot and, and setting a time that worked for all of us. We, we uh, pushed it back, but we're hoping that will start either late September or sometime in October for a Citizens Police Academy. And, and another effort that we undertake uh, throughout the school year is every school every day. It's just an approach where our patrol officers that don't have something that they're doing actively, just randomly stop in at the schools, do a walkthrough, you know, go through the hallway, stop and, you know, always check in with the school to let them know that they're there. But uh, it's been well received by the schools. I know I've talked to the superintendent multiple times. She'd love to see our officers there more often. Those are officers that have additional duties that they're, they're out on a patrol sector. If there's a call for service or an emergency response, then they respond to that first. But, but as time uh, is available, they'll go through the schools. And uh, we regularly meet with, with um, stakeholders. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Mystic Chamber President uh, Bruce Flax asked to meet me about a couple of issues going on in Mystic. Uh, I met with him, had uh, a cup of coffee. We discussed some of those, those items. Um, you know, Heather uh, does, a, does yeoman's work when it comes to meeting with different organizations throughout the town. Uh, we also have personnel on the Juvenile Review Board. So when there's a crime that's uh, referred to the Juvenile Review Board, there, there are some of our officers participate in that as well. Um, a lot of other stuff going on, uh, but, uh, but that, that kind of gives you a thumbnail sketch of, of where we're at. Uh, I know that there's been some, there's a topic that we're going to discuss later on about a noise ordinance, but uh, there's some, some things here that I have that I can certainly hit on, uh, but I'd like to give uh, Sergeant Sawyer and Officer McClellan a couple of minutes if they have things that I've been missing. Maybe you can hit on some of the efforts you do, and, uh, uh, and then you can talk about some other things that I may have missed. Yeah, and just to dovetail off of some of the things we discussed already, it's just as a CPO program, CPO officers, when we were part of this program, when I first started, I was very proud to be a CPO officer and have my designated area. The issues that came up with that as an officer on patrol is the follow-ups, you know, being able to really do those follow-up um, investigations when you're literally going call to call to call. So I just want to make it clear that we are all, all of our officers are community policing oriented. We go with that approach on the road every single day. The reality of our our job, our business, is that we are responding to calls. And a lot of times we can't do those follow-ups. So as the chief mentioned earlier, like an instance for the uh, domestic violence, I'm a d domestic violence liaison officer as well. That's one of my other uh, duties that I have. Um, I communicate, I'm the repository for all of that information that gets passed down, um, either through um, legislation or through uh, uh, policy that comes down um, through post, which is our governing body through the police uh, departments. But 
doing those follow-ups are key when we have a domestic violence victim and you know what happens after we leave you know we put all these things in place we have so many resources um, that we, we now have these these people in place now with our community outreach specialists our CPO officers who can do those follow-ups and I think that to me is the biggest thing and I thank you for putting those helping putting those things in place because to me that's always been the thing that I that concerns me the most and you know we all lose sleep at night doing this job um, and we think about those things and especially me of course I I think about the domestic violence situations that we deal with now so teach domestic violence response um, and do certifications in that as well so um, having these programs in place and having the funding for these programs and the things that we do um, just that follow-up component is really what I'd like to speak to and why I'm speaking to that which we really didn't and we did we tried our best and we we always do with all of our cases we do our follow-ups and and you know try the best that we can but we really sometimes we're going call to call and our intentions are there but we we just don't always have or are able to facilitate those follow-ups so I think you know, I could speak to a lot of those things that the chief already mentioned, but I think we have a really good team and I like that we're expanding the CPO program because I think that's really what people are asking for and, and I'm happy to be a part of that. So, um, yeah, one item that, that he brought up and it's one of the reasons why I thought it was important to have our community outreach specialists here is some of the stuff that we do on a routine basis in police work, we don't adequately follow up on just because of the fact that you're going from call to call. I mean, when I was walking down here, we had three calls going on that were of, of consequence, uh, plus a prisoner that was not happy to be with us. Um, so there's things that are dynamic that happen a lot in law enforcement that people don't see in the general public. Um, having people that are not necessarily wearing a uniform or carrying a badge and gun going out and helping to do some follow up helps build trust and legitimacy. And that's what those two individuals that I introduced to you earlier uh, are doing for this department, but also for this community. You know, when there's a domestic violence incident that happens, they can go out and they can work with the family. They can find assistance. They can find resources that, that ordinarily a police officer won't be able to do after the fact. We may go there, investigate it. The law in Connecticut says if there's a domestic violence incident, we, are, we have to make an arrest of the primary aggressor. There's no discretion there. If you can determine who the primary aggressor is and that a crime has been committed, you are required by law to make an arrest. But a lot of times that follow-up doesn't occur, and that's something that it, Sergeant Sawyer brought up a long time ago that we could do a better job on. This enables us to do that. Uh, they can go out, they can meet, they can find services and assistance for those families, and, and they also work with people in, that are suffering from addiction who maybe we've encountered either as an arrestee or somebody that we've we've hit with Narcan out in the field or somebody that we've encountered for another reason. So they have a lot of resources at their disposal that we can follow up on and take time to do that doesn't require somebody wearing a badge and that people don't feel like they're under the specter of arrest if they talk to them. So that's been real helpful for us. Um, but, yeah, yeah, I, I mean, you've got a lot of things to offer. Um, I'm really grateful to have this this position uh, because I get the opportunity to to do a lot of these these follow ups and um, work in conjunction with patrol and and try to interweave you know some of the the challenges that the patrol is facing um, if they can't you know make make some sort of thing happen within their eight hours they can email me and and I can follow up with it after the fact. Um, one of those things, uh, the programs that we have is called the Cognitive Safety and Awareness Program. Um, we've had it for about four years. Um, it's a, a partnership with Thrive 55. Um, and also at the time uh, when Jessica Patterson was uh, with Parks and Rec, uh, the, th the three entities came together and we wanted to, to find a way to, to help folks who have dementia, um, you know, autism, any other cognitive um, disability and find a way to interact with, with folks better, whether it be on a call for service um, or if somebody were to, to wander off uh, to give our officers better tools and resources kind of at the ready so that we could help those folks in the moment. And so we came up with this program that um, connected us with families. And, and a lot of times it was a matter of something bad happening, somebody wandering off, somebody getting lost, or uh, having a really bad interaction uh, on a scene because we, we didn't know what, what the context of the call was. Um, and so we, we started following up with, with families after uh, officers would, would deal with folks with autism or, or dementia. Um, and we would find ways to connect with them, get more information from them, and 
kind of have a, a database that allowed us to, um, you know, if something were to happen the next time or if, or if somebody were to wander off in the future, we have more information to kind of to help that person and get that person found quickly. Um, so we've kind of developed programs just based on our needs and, and in working with some of the other uh, departments around town, including Thrive 55, we do a, a substantial amount of work with them. Um, the, the yellow dot program is a, another program with the seniors, um, you know, identifying folks who, who uh, are senior drivers who, who might have medical conditions or, or, or something to that effect, allowing our officers and our first responders to recognize that with the yellow dot on the back of their car, and then uh, knowing that they have some uh, information that can help us help them uh, in case of a, a stop or a medical emergency. So, um, you know, having, having the time and the flexibility and the resources uh, within the CPO position and now with the the community outreach specialists um, and, and tapping into you know the the CSOs and also the SROs. We have a, a lot of um, acronyms here, and, and, and it's uh, <laughs> hard to remember sometimes. But having all of these resources and and kind of building this unit that we've we've built with community policing allows us to work together and and really um, help patrol and, and supplement the good work that they're doing um, on a daily basis. A couple other things just uh, came to mind while while Officer McClellan was talking. We also work closely with the uh, Blue Envelope program. We ran something at Fitch High School back, I believe it was in the winter. I know it was October, a yeah. rainy, cloudy, cold day. Um, but it, the autism awareness, where, where people that are out uh, operating the vehicle, if they have autism, they may be alarmed by the police officer stopping them. They hand a blue envelope, it alerts the officer, hey, this is what's going on. Uh, it's a program Heather participated in, uh, along with some of our friends at uh, Southern Connecticut State University and, and some other uh, local agencies and we also have operation lifesaver that we've been working with thrive 55 on which if someone goes missing there's some um, some equipment we've gotten and some of our officers in fact officer fifi has, has, has uh, recently taken the lead on that and some training that goes along with it for someone that may be at risk who um, uh, who, who goes missing um, so uh, you know these, this team of people uh, do a lot of great work for the town. I'm, I'm happy and proud of the work that they do. I hope you are too. Uh, I, I really do appreciate the support. I know we collectively appreciate that support. Um, you know, they're able to do things that, that, you know, the typical patrol officer may not have the time or, or, or latitude to do. And a lot of the things that uh, not just happen with them are unbeknownst to me most of the time. They do things silently. They go out there, they do their job, they get a lot of things done. I'll get a letter saying thank you or compliments of, for their efforts and uh, that means so much to me that they're out there doing a lot of great work. I really think that the innovative approach that we have with our uh, uh, community outreach specialists will pay dividends in the long run and I'm already seeing that, not just from them but from other communities seeking us out saying, hey, what, what did you do? How did you construct this? What benefit does it have? Um, we've gotten inquiries from, from, from some of the local media. And the other thing it does is it, it gives us an ability to utilize them for people that have a high need for our services. And here's what I mean by that. There's sometimes people that we don't arrest, we don't stop, but for some reason they, they, they want to connect with the police department for a lot of different reasons. They're people that we deal with on a regular basis. Uh, they're able to work with them uh, that may have some other challenges that that maybe doesn't require a police officer going to their house and talking to them, but it sometimes will have somebody with a different set of skills that may be more adept to dealing with, with some of the challenges that they face, and that's what the, the community outreach specialists are really geared towards. And, and the other thing I want you to understand, and I tell this uh, as recently as this morning to them, we don't intend, nor is it the program that we have in place to put them in harm's way. If there is something that could put them in harm's way, we deliberately eliminate them from that. They play a supporting role, not a direct role. But if it's follow-up, or if there's some something that we feel is is you know in any way, shape, or form risky, that it's a police officer that takes the lead on it. Um, have I missed anything? No, but I I just think it's really key to form these relationships and have these connections where, again, somebody's not running out the door the minute we you know start engaging and having conversation. We have to go to the next call. But I think. You know, we understand there's two sides to each problem that we're going to be addressing. And in order to navigate through some of those issues, we have to be able to talk to both parties. And a lot of times, you know, now that we have these, you know, people in place that can do that and actually take the time, um, a lot of people want to be heard and have their voices be heard. And, and um, you know, sometimes when we're trying to do our best to, to, you know, hear them voice 
their problems or their issues when there's not an arrest involved or anything like that and they're just trying to explain you know some of the things that maybe we don't have control over maybe it's something the town has to address we know these resources are out there and we can connect them to them but now we have people who can actually sit take the time listen to them and they can have that dialogue where sometimes we're, we're pressed for time and i know i'm beating a dead horse here but it's just it's nice and again i i defer back to when I was a CPO officer and people knew my name. Hey, Officer Sawyer at the time, you know, I, I knew what their issues were and I was able to see those familiar faces and they knew who to go to, but a lot of times I just wasn't available. I had a big area and it just happened. So I, I think I love the direction we're going in and I, I we really do appreciate the support and, you know, we wouldn't be able to do it without you guys, but I think, um, you know, this is something that's going to keep growing. And I think when we mentioned too, and I know um, Officer McClellan with the, the program with her dog, um, she's helped other PDs around the state um, start those programs as well. So we we do have an innovative approach as well. Like we're, we're taking steps, you know, again, you know, I defer back to the body worn cameras. We were one of the first ones in the areas to do that. Like we, we try to be a leader um, in the things that we do. And I think uh, this is a really good approach to that. And I think people, we will be a model to follow. In, a lot of cases with with the direction that we're going in especially in the cpo arena so any final comments no La last couple of things i have to tell you and just on that um, you know uh, what i left off the table of, of sergeant sawyer's list of duties he's also integral in our accreditation process that by the way we were inspected uh, back in june uh, by post c for state accreditation uh, that will be conferred in september we got 100 percent go uh, but the actual awarding of that happens at the uh, uh, the meeting in September. So I'm, I'm proud of that. We're now working towards COLEA, which will be in the fall and early winter months. Uh, and that's an international accreditation. So uh, those, are, those are great things. And he's done a lot of work on that under the auspices of the deputy chief who really, who really he, these guys kind of report to ultimately the way it's broken down um, along with Captain McCarthy. And then the last three things, I've, I've said these before at um, uh, forgive me council meetings or, or RTM meetings but it's you know our core duties the things that we do in policing kind of boil down to what Sir Robert Peel put out in uh, 1829 the Peelian principles which are the nine principles that that, that uh, build on legitimacy and is they're as current today as they were back then but really the three core ideas that I think really are, are manifested in our community policing program and should be is number one the goal isn't necessarily catching criminals it's preventing crime and I'd like to say that we do a pretty good job on that. Uh, every community member must share in the responsibility of preventing that crime. You know, we, we, we draw from the community. The, the police are the public, the public is the police. So we have that partnership. Uh, and then winning approval requires hard work. And that's what these folks do all the time. And I joke about it. You know, I have a badge and gun, but most of my time is spent in front of a computer or on the phone or at meetings or going to things. Uh, they're the ones that are on the streets that are actually doing the hard work not just them but our patrol officers our detectives our dispatchers the team that is behind all of us uh, and and then ultimately hiring officers who represent and understand the community and i think we've done a pretty good job collectively and uh, again rich uh, he's, he's he's got a lot of work uh, but that's one of those key factors that that uh, has made him so valuable to us as well so he's a behind the scenes community policing person heather's uh, Officer McClellan and Chase are front and center now with uh, Officer Afifi joining the team. We're pretty, uh, we're in pretty good shape and, uh, you know, onward and upward. So uh, with that, I, I don't know if the town manager has anything that he wanted me to hit that I missed, but. No, but um, you just like, kind of tell us how it's going down. Sure, I, I can, I can. Um, you know, I, I think it's a double-edged sword. We're, I think we're all seeing the benefits of having a vibrant downtown area that people want to go to and visit. And um, I like going to Mystic. There's a lot to offer down there. There's great restaurants. There's, you know, you go down with beautiful, beautiful scenery. Uh, but with that's come some, some other challenges to us, right? We're, we're putting more officers down there. We're dedicating more resources. Um, you know, we, myself, the town manager, uh, hear about it independently and we also hear it through the traffic authority when there's when there's concerns about traffic or parking or you know um, uh, businesses that are operating have delivery trucks bringing deliveries to their businesses it, it, we're, we're trying to make it a business friendly environment but also manage safety and make sure that the, the, the we strike a balance between the people that live in this community 
but the people who work and own businesses there, and, and sometimes they're in conflict with one another, right? Um, but one of the, the first vestiges of our community policing program is to kind of have a presence down there. And we're, we're trying to reinvigorate that. And, um, you know, we do get complaints about traffic. We get complaints about noise. We get complaints about parking, particularly this time of the year. Those are the big things that we get. And, you know, I don't, uh, we, the three of us met earlier today, and one of the things that we want to make sure that we highlight is not all, our policing and community policing strategies aren't all geared towards Mystic. That is, quite frankly, the squeaky wheel during this time of the year. We get a lot of calls for service down there. We get a lot of complaints. We have concerns from neighbors with, with you know, businesses, neighbors with other neighbors, uh, you know, the challenges that we have in some of the neighborhoods where there's increased traffic, speeding, those types of things, um, and, and noise complaints, right? And, and I think we need to, you know, and I, I encourage you to take a good hard look at the root causes of it. Uh, there are things that we can do to help uh, but there is no easy fix, and there's no easy fix that is just exclusive to the police department. You know, there's a lot of other components to it. There's some strategies that I would like to see happen that I think would be beneficial, uh, but those are not within my purview of the police chief of implementing, and I think they're things that you might want to consider in the future. Uh, but, but I, I, you know, there's a lot of things that we work to, to target. You know, if there's complaints, we put additional officers down, and this is one I'll, I'll hit on um, quickly. <coughs> But some of the complaints we get are late at night, noise, bar closing time, you know. There's no college right now, so those that are able to uh, to drink, that are home from college, may go down downtown Mystic. They may make a little bit of noise when the bars close, and that gets amplified based on walking through the streets of downtown. And, and we try to address those by having additional officers down there. Uh, sometimes we're able to put additional officers through overtime or special assignments. But other times when things are happening in other locations throughout the town, those officers get pulled off. And I can tell you that there have been times I've gotten it. You know, people have said to me, hey, Chief, you know, I don't see anybody at downtown Mystic. I can assure you, the, the, we have officers working. They're probably at a call for service. They're probably at an incident happening somewhere else. They might be investigating a traffic accident or, you know, a burglar alarm or something else. So we, we, we lift and shift those uh, resources based on what's happening at that particular time. But I can tell you that we're, we're, we're dedicating a lot of time and energy. We try to work with our partners in Stonington uh, to kind of have a, a, a concerted effort on, on how to approach those things, which you may or may not know, it, it's been, you know, the whole parking study was really initiated by a conversation with myself and, and Chief Stewart at the time of, hey, whatever we do on our side of the river has to be in concert with what you do, because we don't want to push the, the problem back and forth. We want to make sure we have a concerted effort when we address these issues. And that also kind of manifested itself in the coffee with the chiefs. We, that was uh, not supposed to be, we're only going to do coffee with the cops and mystic. No, that was a different approach. That was coffee with the chiefs because we both shared responsibilities in, in mystic that, that we thought it would be an effective way to handle it by going out there and meeting with residents and businesses. Um, so I'd really encourage you to, to, to take a look at some of the things that have been uh, brought to the council that, that might help. Uh, all of us collectively address some of the things that, that I know I'm hearing about, I know the town manager is hearing about, our officers are hearing about, but you're probably hearing about it too as elected officials, and there's there's some ways that we can approach that, and I'd, I'd like to be part of the solution. Some of the challenges are kind of new this year. I think noise is a little bit down this year compared to the last couple of years. However, we're getting more instances of fighting and uh, out in public, as well as uh, not using our not utilizing public restrooms where they should be. <laughs> there seem to be increased uh, complaints about that. Yeah. Well, last last summer, I met with some residents in downtown Mystic at uh, Steamboat Wharf, and you know they brought up some some problems. Some of those have dissipated, but as the town manager said, others have, have morphed into other concerns. But um, you know, we're trying to have <coughs> in this room uh, back in uh, I believe it was right before. St. Patrick's Day, we had a meeting with all the, we invited every uh, liquor establishment in the town of Groton to come to this, this meeting. We had the Liquor Control Commission, gave them a recipe for success, which basically talked about underage drinking, talked about, you know, uh, over-serving, uh, a lot of the other things that go along with having a liquor establishment. We had, we were fortunate, I invited the uh, Liquor Control Commission in, the, they gave a briefing, their supervisor gave a briefing on what things, uh, uh, they can and can't do as far as serving of alcohol. So we had a, what I thought was a pretty effective uh, meeting in this room. Um, nevertheless, you know, we also do some underage things. We did some of them earlier in the summer. Uh, some some establishments here in Groton didn't pass. Others did. And, and 
Uh, I'll tell you exactly what I told some of the bar owners that called me and said, you know, what happened here? This is, uh, no, we're very straightforward. When we do those things, we don't send somebody in with a fake ID. We send an underage person under the uh, supervision of a, of a police officer, an undercover police officer that goes into the establishment. All they do is ask for a drink. If they're not carded, that's a violation. And that's what happens. There's no one. I had one uh, owner of an establishment ask me, well, how do I know it wasn't a fake ID? It's not a fake ID. It was an underage ID. It just, your, your, your people need to check for that. They're required to ask. Um, and that was all explained back in the, in the spring. Um, I hope I'm hitting on the things that you're, you're doing. Yeah, and um, if we've kind of, I think you've tried to step up ticketing also for parking to try to help with that. We have, there's, there's you know, there is challenges. Um, we cannot mark tires, you know, when there's, you know, there's a two hour parking limit. It's very hard. We, we do have the CSOs and police officers out there. It is hard to enforce that. And, and I'm, I will tell you the same thing you've heard of time and time again from consultants. And, and I know this to be the case. I, it's primarily the violators that we're having in downtown Mystic are the business owners and people that work in downtown Mystic. And that's what's creating some of these cascading effects. When there's a person that works at an establishment that's there eight hours, that's a parking space that doesn't ever turn over and it creates some of these other effects where if I'm going down to downtown Mystic with my family and I'm going out to dinner at the Oyster Club or Margarita's or one of the places down there going to get ice cream or pick up some donuts or get something at Sift and I can't find a parking space, now I'm driving around and I'm creating a tra traffic and then I'm pushing myself out into the, the complaints that we're getting are some of the streets, not, not West Main, not New London Road necessarily. Um, Water Street, we're getting them on some of the outer streets where people are getting pushed out because now they're going onto those streets speeding, right? Because they're looking for a parking space. They want to get to a space before, and, they're, and they're circling through the downtown area. And this is not just my own, you know, you, I think you've heard this from, from the parking studies. That's what's happening. The same thing happens at night when <coughs> an individual uh, uh, goes to an establishment. They park out further out and now it's bar closing time or it's time for them to leave and they've come with their friend or you know wife or husband and they're walking downtown and just having a conversation and they're going off to the side streets and they're walking in front of residents that's now a noise issue right they're, they're they may not be speaking at the top of their lungs but at at 1 o'clock in the morning you know i can tell you when somebody walks by my house talking i'm going to hear them even if it's a normal voice and it's going to you know it kind of gets into the next topic that you're you know, that that i know you're going to be considering tonight but there's there are root causes here. There are, there are things that we can do to help impact the problem, but there are also tools that I think would be helpful to really change the dynamics of those problems. And um, you know, I, I, think, I think the parking study, that was, I think you need to take a good hard look at that. I think you need to consider it. And uh, I think you've issued 88 tickets in Mystic this year, in yes. downtown Mystic. Yep. Um, to date. But I believe the fine is only $20, first of all, which that needs to be increased. And there's no real repercussions if you don't pay it. Yeah, so, we have, so we've got our attorneys looking at what are our options to beef this up, to get better compliance. Mm -hmm. the, the, a number of years ago, um, it was during my tenure, but for the longest time, parking violations here were $10 throughout the town. And, and we did up them, and, it, and I believe it took uh, council action at the time to increase them to 25 um, You know, there needs to be some, some consequences, and there's some some things that I think help us to do that. Uh, I, I'm not, you know, I, I, I am, you know, I know, I know not everybody on the council is in favor of this, but I certainly am in favor of some type of paid parking in downtown Mystic that would help turn that over. Uh, I think the general consensus of the police department is that would be helpful. It's not an all-in-one solution, but it would be helpful. And I know that some of the um, private organizations, churches, um, with parking lots have have started you know, using that um, that scan to pay for parking. And just to give you an idea, I, I was driving through uh, on the Stonington side and one of the businesses, it's $5 per half an hour. So if, if you think to yourself, you know, I could park here illegally for two hours and pay just as much as if I were to pay legally for two hours, um, you know, at one of these pay to, pay to parks, I think that the increase would, would definitely, you know, maybe influence people to do it the, the legal way and the smart way. And it gets back to the things I read. The appeal, you know, community members must share in responsibility for preventing crime. Although, you know, parking scoff laws are not the top ten violators of, of laws. You know, you know, we don't put them up with the, 
the big offenses, but you know, it is something, it's a quality of life issue. It, is, it does have, like I said, some cascading effects, and I think it's something that we really need to take a good hard look at. Uh, I know from the police department standpoint, it, there's, you know, we'd like to be part of that discussion. Um, I hope that the, 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 our input is valued because I think it would help overall for the town and would, would be a positive thing. Um, and it could certainly be offset at times by shaping that the right way. Thank you. Happy to entertain any questions. All right. Well, thank you for that update. I, I do um, think community policing is among uh, some of the most important work that you do. I like that you said that you know you tried to be a leader in everything that you do, and I think that's evidenced by Officer McClellan's award. I I thought just when I saw you been nominated for that, I thought that was a great you know achievement and testament to your work. But just to win is is, is even is even greater, and it's well deserved. Um, I also stopped by uh, uh, Chase's birthday last week. It was w very well attended. Um, she's definitely the, the most popular person in town so just keep doing the, the great work that you're doing when I walked into that mayor I, <laughs> I and I told uh, Officer McClellan at the time I thought Gronk was signing autographs right. I, and I, I'm not this isn't embellishing I saw a line coming out the door and I'm like what's going on here? right was, um, very very true it was impressive yeah so is and, there and any a, a credit to the, the library staff I mean yeah. they they dedicated seven of their librarians seven Teen volunteers, I mean, the way they come together and, and facilitate this stuff, we literally just show up with cupcakes and a couple dogs and, and they do all the work. So right. the, the kudos to them, for sure. Thank you, yeah. very good. Is there any questions from the council? Council Westerville? One question, thank you. And congratulations, great job. Um, thank you. And you guys do a great job. I really do appreciate all that you do. Um, I probably should know this, but the yellow dot program you just talked about, yes, I, sir. I'm not familiar with that. I'm, could you just tell me what that is? Sure. Um, so it, it used to be called Triad, and it's essentially a, um, a partnership with uh, Thrive 55 and uh, the, the Stonington uh, Odd Fellows, and they, they help us fund the program. Um, and the idea is uh, we provide a yellow sticker uh, that goes uh, on the back windshield of a vehicle of a senior driver or you know, there, there were some other folks that decided they wanted to be part of this program too. It doesn't have to necessarily be a senior driver, uh, but that's what the, the program is was started for. Um, and what it does is that the sticker helps uh, first responders identify uh, that there might be a senior driver in the car. They might have medical conditions that we need to know about if they were to uh, go into medical distress, if they were to get into a car accident. Um, we might make a motor vehicle stop and wonder why, you know, this person is, is maybe acting in a certain way. They might be diabetic, something like that. Um, and then we provide a yellow envelope with um, uh, basically an informational packet that they would fill out that contains uh, some information that helps first responders, uh, emergency contact information, um, if there's any medications on board. That way, when, if and when that person is transported to the hospital, we literally just give the yellow envelope to the uh, medical staff that's transporting them and they can be on their way with as much context as possible uh, so that that person can get helped in the moment as well as, as possible. Great, thank you very much. Thank you. Council Franco. Thank you. I am an avid supporter of uh, community policing and um, of the social workers that we brought in and also with um, the uh, school resource officers as well. And I've um, always pushed for the initiatives for funding for all of the police, um, just about all of the police initiatives. Um, and I would say that I, I've attended the policing um, community committee meeting where um, Lorena had listed the vast amount of things that she is taking care of within our community. And the list is vast. Mm -hmm. And um, it was just such a wonderful, I think it's such a wonderful addition to our community. And now to have a second one on board with us now, I think it's just really gonna help. I do know that when she was speaking, one thing that sort of hit me was when she had said, um, she looks at items where they list like thefts, I guess, or stolen items, and when people are arrested for stealing things. And she's like, I, I now look at these because it, there's a difference from somebody who steals food versus somebody who's stealing like a high-end item to make sure. some money for whatever other reasons. But just, 
she, and then she reaches out to the people that may have stolen food because she thinks there might be an issue there. And that's the reach out too, that where a, a police officer probably can't follow up on these things and check to make sure they're getting services that they need or how to reach out and, and fix these things. But the list and some of the stories she told were very heartwarming and um, it made me very happy and proud that we as a town council created these positions with your guidance and, and put them in our community. Because the way I look at it is many of these things are not required by the state of Connecticut. These are things our community is taking upon and, and, gr and growing the police department with these different initiatives and for our community at large. Um, and I, I can tell you probably, I don't know how many years it's been now, at least four to five, like just the growth of things that are happening in your department is, it's just astonishing and, and I applaud you um, for having, to, for doing these things. And I'm going to finish simply by saying that um, Officer McClellan, to get such a national award, it's um, for me personally, I am just simply, you've just shown a light on community policing and been recognized by the highest in our land. And it, it just makes me so honored and proud that you are here in Groton and you are among us and I am just so darn proud of it. So I just want you to know that and, and thank you for everything that you all do for our community. Thank you. You, you did see the medal that Chase got, right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, if I may, on that note, that what she was referring, what uh, uh, Lorena was referring to is we do an end of shift summary. So it highlights some of the things that have happened during the shift. And there are times, recently there was one local hotel where she delivered food to them brought food to this uh, family that had a, there was a larceny that occurred and it was that someone stole food from, from um, this family and she was able to facilitate that. She has a lot of networks, a lot of uh, community contacts, works with a lot of different entities. Um, both, th that's gonna be a dynamic duo, uh, the two of them. So um, I'm really happy they get along great, which was, uh, you know, awesome to see the first day they met they hit it off and they're going to do a lot of great work and, and she's been doing a lot of great work and this will just be an additional multiplier to help facilitate that so thanks for recognizing that it's awesome thank you council Bordelon. um thank you um thank you for the presentation uh community policing is very important uh, you know as it was stated it's been around forever it's you know um something when i took intro to cj back in i don't know like the 90s uh, in criminal justice and some of my psychology courses, you know, community policing is treating the whole person and the families, and and it's something that a lot of communities have gotten away from, and not not intentionally, as you know, it's just time and burnout and, and accessibility and manpower and woman power. Um, so it's great that we are you know looking at that um, from a mandated reporter standpoint. You know, it was stated. I remember being. Uh, watching this video and you know a cops go in it was a drug raid they're flipping things there's gloves there's body cavity searches you name it. everything's happening it's fast it's quick it's moving and there's dogs and the thing about it is is that back many years ago there was not mandated reporting and so children would return home to this house that's been flipped upside down mom and dad are in jail and there's nobody there taking care of the children no one even knows that they're in jail and now that model has moved where you know it's like wait there's a children's bed here a crib i see toys and that whole model has changed of really like, you know, not saying you weren't mandated reporters, but there just wasn't the same emphasis of really treating what's going on and finding out. And it's, and as it was stated, you know, cops go in and law enforcement of detectives go in and they can't handle all of that. And so this is where these other pieces may come in. And so that that's exciting to me. And that's something that I was taught a long time ago. And, um, you know, it's great to see that we're enhancing that program. Um, it's sad to say that it went away for a little while uh, for being cut, but um, definitely it's so important. Uh, policing is not just the arrest we make or the criminal. It's, it's, a, it's a way of how can we live in this community as a whole together. You know, um, there's noise. There's, there's things that have, have changed to make it where we have to find a way to kind of uh, all kind of cohabitate, you know, together. Um, so that's great. And I think all the improvements. Uh, improvements and programs for seniors and disabled mm -hmm. and other medical conditions are, are, are you know, vastly important. Um, 
and being aware of, of those items. Um, so I'm, I'm excited for those types of outreach. You know, one of the things that I've seen and I was reading recently as well is, I don't know if it's called the yellow sticker, but it was something similar to that in a different state. And a person has a medical condition, they're constantly, you know, got a, a tick or a twitch. And, you know, being pulled over, if asking to walk, they might not be able to walk a straight line and they're not under the influence. But having some type of medical thing and they're stating that this is their baseline. You know, things like that is so important and vital to pick up on. So I commend you guys for your efforts uh, for, to, for doing this. And uh, congratulations on your award. I met you a while back when I was battling breast cancer. Mm -hmm. And you, were, you had a different dog at that time. And you were just so interested in the Smile Cancer Center and what you could do to kind of get involved and, mm -hmm. and in sending out one of those pink badges and such. So um, I appreciate um, all your work and congratulations. Thank you. And I just wanted to note that. Councilor Parker has arrived. Okay, Councilor Parker has arrived at 8.08. You'll be happy to know um, we've had a longstanding, it kind of hit on one of the points you brought up, a longstanding relationship with the Department of Children and Family. Yeah. We've had an embedded uh, DCF worker with the department since prior to my arrival. There's been someone uh, from DCF who has a desk in the police department that can go out to calls that we can refer things to directly. Um, you know, my, and, and we are, as you said, I, my 30 years of police work, we're mandated reporters. Those things have to be, there are certain criteria that needs um, mandatory reporting, and that's, that's something that does happen. And we're fortunate, like I said, and I know that Sergeant Sawyer, when he was a patrol sergeant, would, you know, work closely with them, and, and certainly when you were on patrol, too, those, those embedded people are helpful, and we're, we're fortunate to have that relationship as well. Yeah. That's a great point. Any further questions? Council Borderline? And the other piece to that um, is, you know, sometimes an encounter for a child or a family member in that situation that has no part of maybe what the investigation is could create a bad feeling or an encounter. So it's great to have that follow through that we didn't have before so that, you know, that person that goes off to live a very productive life down the road has a better interpretation of what the police do. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you guys are faced with going into some of these situations, I mean, you have children that they just see their mom and dad are being taken away. They don't know what they were doing. And it could be kind of, um, you know, tra traumatic for them to see. So having, you know, Chase and having these community social workers to come in to kind of ease the pain a little bit and maybe you know, remove these children or other you know other folks in the home and uh, you know allow for cooperation with the you know the suspects to um, ease the burden and, and there's there's ways that you can do that it's not all just like let's arrest them right now and but have that wrap around where it's like hey checking back in how's this kid doing you know what did they see what happened i mean and that's so important that can um, be vital to long-term exposure and experiences down the road and that's one of the things that community policing was, you know, seeing and with the mandated reporting is, is having that ability to kind of come back. And uh, I think that's, that's very vital. And I think, you know, we talked about senior services today and community policing, I, I'm a, a big component of because I think it's another part of a service we provide. You know, with like, again, it's not just how many tickets, how many arrests, it's what did we do and what did we do to help change somebody's life by making two neighbors get along or, you know, changing the exposure or the, or the experience for somebody. So um, I think that's great. I'm, I'm, you know, I'm excited to see all the work that's done and uh, you know, hope that um, you know, we continue to thrive in that way and uh, consider all, all the affected parties uh, in, involved in when there's an incident of, of sorts. So, um, and, and a great thing was, you know, you, you know, we talk about community policing. I was in Coles one year, like about a year ago, I think. This lady, you know, person looked like they were probably having a drug withdrawal and they were combative. And they probably were about to shoplift or something. But there were children around, families, people, you know, and this had to happen. They were trying to get this person out the door. And there were people there that were talking and trying to, you know, give, give a, you know, it's, it, it's important to have folks like Officer McCullen to come in and kind of, you know, be a part of, you know, the peacemaking and, and understanding. Um, because, you know, the exposure was just there. You, you had no way to hide from it, you know. Um, even for someone like me, I was like, wow, this is very interesting. And, you know, there was nowhere else to go. They kind of moved everybody over to one side to kind of get this person out. So, um, and as we see, you know, the opioid uh, crisis increase, where people are finding people passed out and things like that. I mean, it's very traumatic. I mean, someone just relaxing the sun now, you're like, are they okay? And it's nice to, you know, have uh, this, this community outreach available for families. Um, during this time, so thank you. Thank you. Any further discussion? 
Okay, seeing none. Thank you for your update as well. Keep doing the great work we know you'll do. I think I'm around for the next topic too. Okay. okay. Very true. No noise ordinance. It's gonna be a long time. take a break. Want a break? Sure. Um, council will stand in recess at 8.13.
Council is back from recess at 8.36, and we are on to noise ordinance. Um, Can I just say? Uh, sure. Okay. Uh, just an introduction. This referral came from Councilor McBride, and um, I'm sure he'll want to speak to this. I just want to make it clear that in the packet, it gives a little history about when we looked at it back in, when the council in 2018 looked at it. Uh -huh. uh, as well as the ordinance at the time. That's just for informational purposes. That's not to be reviewed or looked at in any way. But solely tonight is for Councilor McBride to present um, his, his uh, you know, to get it for discussion and then to, for us to know whether to get a, see if there's enough uh, counselors in favor of moving on to the next stage of looking at anything. So just looking for a little guidance. All right, thank you. We have the police chief here again for this one. I don't know if you have any um, update for, or anything, or you just want us to no, I, I, start I'm, out with questions. I'm certainly willing to listen. I do have some thoughts on this. Okay. Um, so we'll, but I, I know that you have a proposal, or okay. there's probably a discussion that you want so to So, Councilor McBride, questions. if you'd like to. Yeah, I don't have anything prepared uh, proposal. This was more brought forth, I think it was, I don't know, it was back in September. Uh, the reason for the noise ordinance was obviously there were many residents uh, who were complaining about the excessive use of noise. Um, as the package that you provided indicates it was looked at by previous councils and I brought it forward to have some discussion at the council level discussion with yourself and, and your officers to find out what if anything could be done uh, to move a noise ordinance forward for the betterment of the community so uh, it's really I'm looking for uh, professional advice from you and your staff you spoke about it earlier uh, at tonight's meeting about some other options that we could that we could move forward with but I'm just really here to try to see if this council would consider something to try to alleviate uh, the concerns with the noise, specifically in downtown Mystic, but also throughout. And I know other communities have that, so anything they have some ordinances, so anything you have on other comparable communities, they can bring forward so the council can be informed to make a good decision on how we can move forward. That's really what I was looking for. Sure. Thanks. Uh, well, with that, you know, in 2018, this, this did come up and I spoke about it, and I did, um, you know, it was considered by the council at that time. I, I, I did speak out um, against it at the time, uh, my, my position really hasn't changed, and, and here's why. It really, the, there is a law in the books, um, part of the breach of peace statutes that we've used, and we use it regularly, uh, which is creating a public disturbance, which, which is a state fraction. It's done just like a traffic ticket. We issue that. Uh, an ordinance would be done somewhat the same way. Um, this time I did a little bit more analysis. I, I, I uh, utilized staff to kind of take a look at it within the police department, and, and uh, Sergeant Sawyer agreed to, to stay here with me just to offer moral support or, or his uh, his own thoughts on this. But but really, I, I, the, the consensus I'm getting, and I sent it out to our supervisory team and got some really thoughtful responses uh, from a couple of our lieutenants who really did some research. One of, uh, one of the lieutenants uh, gave me some really good information. But to back up a little bit, uh, yes, as I articulated before, we do get noise complaints. Uh, they're really confined to one section of the town right now. Um, and, it, and it does get into the whole business atmosphere. Again, I'm not trying to say that everything we do is about Mystic, it isn't, but really the complaints that we get, and I've got the data here that, that backs that up, that says that the complaints are coming primarily from the downtown Mystic area. And I do appreciate and understand that when you have mixed use, you have uh, residences in, a, in an old historic district uh, where people want to live and it's a beautiful place to live, but when it's one of the top tourist attractions in the country now, uh, it's bringing in a lot of people. And there is some, again, it gets back to the, the stuff I talked about a few minutes ago. Um, but, but remarkably, our noise complaints are down. Um, in 2022, we had 145 noise complaints throughout the entirety of Groton. Uh, this year, we've had 70. You know, obviously, we're not through the whole year. But if you compare it, uh, 1st of January 22 to uh, July 25th of, of 22 to the same period of time this year, 84 complaints last year, 70 this year. So the number is down. So some of the things that we're doing have worked. Um, and I'm not saying that it's exclusively the police department. There's certainly a zoning component to this. We've we've introduced outdoor dining. We've allowed people to put um, uh, outdoor patios and, and, and rooftop bars where, you know, there's a there's re zoning regulations that say you got to shut down by 10. Our officers have enforced that. We've done everything that we can help with that, but it is a zoning regulation. Not a, not a violation of criminal law. So the zoning enforcement needs to be a part of that. Um, so at times where there are problems, our officers will investigate it. And many of the times they will not issue an infraction. And I think that even where there are noise ordinance, 
It may compel, uh, there may be a thought that we have to issue it if we're going out there doing decibel testing, using instruments, which by the way, cost a lot of money, require calibration, require training. And then, oh, by the way, we're doing it on a town ordinance. So when we issue a, a citation on that, the officer's gonna have to go to testify, which means the hidden costs are, you're going to court, you issued this Saturday night at midnight, you're off on Tuesday, you're gonna be there for a minimum four to eight hours of overtime to pay for that, uh, to, for, your, for your potential testimony. Um, but getting back to some of the feedback I've gotten from the supervisory staff, um, and again, much of this is pretty pretty thoughtful, and, and uh, I've had discussions with my colleagues. There are cities and towns in the state of Connecticut that do have this ordinance that do not enforce it um, for a variety of reasons. There's some questions as to uh, the enforceability of it, but there's others uh, that, that don't have the training, that, that don't want to purchase the equipment. Um, and there's also, in, in reading some of the stuff uh, that I have here, and I can just highlight a few of them, um, it's really, it really is geared at the downtown Mystic area. The snort noise ordinance seems to be about. Um, there's no excessive noise definition in the ordinance um, or the proposed one that went out a couple of years ago, I should say. Um, talking to colleagues from around the country, uh, we, one of our uh, lieutenants just recently graduated from the FBI National Academy, and that's a network. Uh, I graduated many years ago from that, but it, it's a network of colleagues from across the, across the globe, really. But canvas them, hey, can you, can you provide me feedback on noise ordinances that you've had in your community? And to a person that all the responses he got were strong recommendations against it, um, that other police departments find that it takes staff away from other tasks that they should be doing. So if we're out there monitoring these noises, having officers assigned to take out a gauge, monitor activity, that's an officer that's not out there doing DUI enforcement that may be tied up with other things, but it, it's, a, it's an impact on service. And what they also said, anecdotally, this, this causes conflict between neighbors, where there's a person mowing his lawn, there's somebody that may reach the level on that, that meter that, for whatever reason, there's a beef going between new na two neighbors, they call the police and want it enforced. So that puts us as a police department in a difficult position. I just got done talking to you about the efforts that we're making in community policing, trying to bring people together and trying to have a partnership with the community. This puts us directly in conflict with that, puts us in the middle of, of neighbor disputes, which we are involved in already, right? But this gives another tool that if there's a, a, a pre-existing neighbor dispute, this is just one more thing that they're gonna utilize the police to maybe try and referee uh, between, between them. Um, you know, one, one, and I'm quoting from, from a response I got, one individual in particular stated that this has resulted in more neighbor complaints because neighbors discover the police department has such capabilities and constantly allege noise violations from their neighbor. And it may require us to go out there and there's no noise at the time, so there's nothing to gauge, but it is, again, a, a use of resources. Um, certification is, is, is costly and depends on how many officers we have um, um, doing this. And you know, I find myself conflicted sometimes too. In the recent years, we've been told there are things that we want police doing, and there are things we don't want police doing. Um, you know, I, I use this homelessness. Great, glad that we've got our community outreach specialists. But homelessness is not a crime. We don't arrest people for being homeless. Why is the police involved in that? Because it's part of our community caretaker function. But there's a line that we walk. Here we're looking at something that, that really, you know, there's zoning regulations. We have, you know, talking to one of my colleagues, he said, you know, how do you enforce something? And this is a, a colleague that has a noise ordinance. You as a municipality have granted permission to businesses to operate. You've allowed them to have bands. You've allowed them to do these things. And now you're saying, oh, we've given you that. You've gone through the zoning. You've gone through all the permitting process. But now we're going to enact an ordinance that allows us to now fine you for violating something you got prior approval for. It's kind of a, it, it's contra, you know, it's a contradiction. Um, now, that's not to say that there aren't issues. Yes, there are. There, there are people, there are times when it's excessive. There are times when people either individually or collectively uh, create an inordinate amount of noise that reaches that level that is enforceable. And again, I go back to 53A181, which is the breach of beast statute, which if you breach the peace or, conduct, or, or disorderly conduct, it's the same, uh, same premise. There's an underlying infraction that we can issue, and we do with regularity, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, our officers use that quite frequently, um, out in the field where, you know, it is, it is a bit subjective. There's no meters. It's, you know, the breach of peace statute says fighting or tumultuous behavior. The, the um, statute for creating a public disturbance is less than that. Um, 
I think it's been effective. Um, trying to read some other notes. You know, one 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 uh, one of our supervisors, one of our lieutenants, went through and did an analysis looking at what that what the decibel levels equate to. And depending on what research you do, it says, you know, the, the, the 55 decibel level versus 45 could be as, it could be a refrigerator running, could be a bunch of different things. So, I, I'm, you know, if, if, if it's the town council feels that it's important and that it is something that we should do, then certainly the, you know, the police department will, you know, carry on. I, 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 I don't, I do appreciate the issues that are being articulated. Um, and to the extent that we can, we're trying to impact them in a positive way. Um, I don't know that this is the solution. I think there's a, a holistic approach to, to some of these things that we need to look at. But in and of itself, I don't know that the noise um, ordinance will necessarily do what we're hoping it would do. Uh, and that's, that's I'm being as, as, as frank. And, uh, now, one of the things that we have to work harder on in our department, and, and this has come to my attention, we've talked to uh, some of the supervisors, I've heard it. And it may have been said to you at the same uh, in the same way, but well, and I'll call an officer and I'll get the response. Well, we don't have a noise ordinance, so there's nothing we can do about it. And my response to that is, you are wrong. There is something we can do about it if, in fact, it reaches that level. If an officer is telling someone that, then we need to do a better job of educating them on the statutes. Uh, I'm a fan of, and I've I've not only said this to the council and the RTM, but I've testified in the legislature, if there's laws on the books that you want enforced, we will enforce them. If there's laws you don't want enforced, then take them off the books and move. Um, there are laws on the books under Connecticut general statute that we can that we can utilize uh, without creating additional ones to, um, uh, to maybe cloud the issue a little bit. Um, but, but it is something I know it's important. I think Councilor McBride, you wouldn't bring it up if it wasn't something that you felt was important and that, that your constituents have said, hey, we need you to do something about this. I, I think that maybe there's a better way we can approach it. And um, that's my, my frank and honest opinion. Thank you. Take okay. Yeah, I'll just comment. I, I appreciate your, your honesty and the detail that you provided. And I, I would never support something that you would pretty much wholeheartedly oppose. So I appreciate all that information. Um, with that being said, I mean, can you elaborate on some more details on what else we can do um, to further this along, such as maybe more citations, or you mentioned the parking. This council discussed the, discussed the parking at great length, but I'm just trying to solve the issue. And that, that this obviously, based upon your professional experience, is not something we should consider. So I'm not going to move it forward uh, any further based upon what you're saying. But I do want to try to put something forward that we can try to solve these issues because they are <clears throat> increasing from from what I'm here. Not increasing on your your citations, but it, it's it's an issue in downtown Mystic. So. Yeah, I, I, I can tell you, you know, and, and I'm sitting here with a guy that, that does a lot of the work and works works patrol from time to time, and, and uh, it is we're talking about a finite or a confined area, right? I mean, let's let's call it what it is. The issue that exists is primarily in the downtown Mystic area, and I think that probably was articulated to you. If, yes. Am I mistaken in that? No, that's wrong. Um, and it is busy down there, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. And if I could comment too, just from a patrol uh, perspective and being the community policing officer for that area, and I was for many years in the beginning of my career. Um, it's something that continues and it's, you know, we, even geographically, those tall buildings, just the noise, you know, bouncing back. But there's a lot of things that go into that. But I will tell you, when we worked, we would have patrols down there and we, we pretty much flood the area at those those bar closing times. And, you know, yes, we were there and we're doing the, the bar you know, we, we had bar cars at the time. We'd have people come in and kind of monitor the area right at closing because we understand that. And we're not, and as we're discussing, we're not downplaying that at all. That's been an issue since I've been, I'm going on 16 years now. And it, it's always been something that we've, we've worked on. But I know in my capacity, when I was on patrol, we talked to those bars. You know, we had bars down there and they've changed management a couple of times and owners. But we'd have them close the windows. We'd have them take it inside. We'd go in there and talk to them and say, hey, guys, it's getting up there. That noise needs to come down. And mm -hmm. I think when we took that approach, where we actually one-on-one, -on -one, person to person, say, hey, I know you have a business to run here, but it's it's getting a little loud. You know, we really, we got to know. And I think that's part of our, you know, I hate to keep going back to our community policing. But when we have these issues, and granted, you know, a lot of our community policing um, uh, tools that we have, we have people that can speak to those bar owners the next day if they're not there, 
<clears throat> or discuss a plan, you know, something like that. But I, I can tell you, we, we do address those issues and we've had people work uh, plain clothes that would actually, you know, just stand by and wait and just see until, you know, what was happening and watch the traffic and see if people were walking outside with their drinks or see if the noise was getting louder. And they would go up and identify themselves as officers and say, hey, you know, we're at that point and we need to work on that. And, and I think that level of communication and granted, if we came back and it didn't and it continued, we would write those tickets. We would, you know, those infractions or say, hey, you know, we don't want to take this route because nobody wants to approach that way because people have a business to run and there's, you know, conversely, people want to enjoy themselves in our town. But I think at, the, at those levels, we're willing to work with those businesses one on one and do what we can on a case by case basis. And I think we've done that a lot in the past. But again, if we're in there and we're working those areas, trying to watch that noise and, you know, monitor and out of our cars and we get a call, sometimes we just get pulled out of there and, you know, it happens. But we it's try that, to take a proactive approach. Yeah, it's that cops on dots, right? When we're, you know, CJ 101, where their <laughs> problem is, you put the cops there to try and address the problem. That's what we do try and do. They get pulled away. They're, they're, they're active, they're busy in other areas. Um, but we've tried to do that, and that's one of the, the, the edicts that I've given to our community policing unit is let's try and address this problem. I, I think in the, in the email that I sent to the council a couple of weeks ago, you know, Officer McClellan has done an outstanding job with outreach to create that network in the community. Now the next iteration of our community policing is going to be the problem-oriented policing, addressing these things, and they've already started working on that. And, and I would say that predated even the arrival of Officer Fifi and his new assignment. That, that uh, story I told you about the meeting we held in this room with all the liquor establishments, I mean, that's, that's by and large where that noise is coming from, right? They may have bans, bans shut down at a certain time. There are zoning regulations. Our zoning officer we work hand in hand with, um, making sure that they comply with that. You know, there's, there's there are things that we can do as a police that we should be doing and we do do, uh, but they're, they're part of that solution as well. Um, you talked about parking, and uh, again, we're, we're, Mystic is successful right now, and I would say even during my tenure as chief, it has grown. It is more, there are more businesses down there. It's more attractive to go down there. People enjoy it. They, you know, if you live in Mystic, you you value that um, uh, that neighborhood you live in. You value that that whole community. But there's people that are coming from all over the Northeast and farther to, to visit there as well. Um, and there, I, I, I again, I not to double down on it, but we. Listen, we, there's a parking problem in Mystic. We know that. We've known that for years. We've got to do something to address it because I think it creates cascading effects. And, and we know what the problem is. It's not a secret. We know what it is. And, and it does create problems with noise. It does create additional traffic. It does create congestion. And, and those all factor into one another. Um, you know, can you, if a person over imbibes at a, a liquor establishment and they go out and they cause a fight, yeah, we know how to handle that. We arrest them. Right. That, that's, you know, we get a report that's it, it happens, you know, whether it's in downtown Mystic or L.A. or New York City, that happens. And sometimes people that maybe have had too good of a time may be a little bit too loud when they're leaving. Um, you know, that is why we we also try to have that partnership with those businesses to educate them on what the rules are. Um, but but we have a congested area. Um, that's very popular, that, that has limited amounts of, of parking and people are out side during this weather, you know, the neighbors that, that probably are hearing this noise have, like I would have if I were living down there, having the windows open. Um, so there's, you know, there's there's things that we are trying to do, um, but it isn't exclusively a police problem. It's, it's certainly something that we need to work in concert with other, other organizations. And, and, and part of that too, and that was getting back to something I mentioned before, I met with the chamber. I brought that up with the, uh, um, uh, the president of the chamber of commerce saying, hey, these are, you know, what can you do to help us out on this? Can you maybe have a discussion? Because we're getting a lot of pressure uh, from neighbors about some, some concerns and we want them to have a thriving business. Um, I want them to be successful. I know you do too. I mean, you want, you, you've attracted some, some great places to, to go and I like going down there myself, uh, but you know, it's, it's one of those difficult, you, you, with the good, you're gonna get some of the bad and we're, our job is to try and keep that bad from not being too bad, right? Prevent the crime rather than, than the absence of crime there helps to justify what we're doing. Um, so I don't, 
I don't know if I gave you a, a script of exactly what we need to no, do. No, you gave me a plenty, plenty of detail. I appreciate it. Just one last quick question. The number of citations, has it grown over the past few years? And do you issue a, an yeah, abundance it, of them out every year? It has um, in in uh, the last couple of years. We, it is, it is the, we have community service officers and one of their primary functions is to do that when we put them out there. They're part-time employee. We, you know, we, we utilize them when they're available and we can get them in. Um, they're telling me the same things that, that I already know. Some of it's difficult to enforce and, and there is, you know, case law. We used to be able to go out, if you were doing parking enforcement, you had a long stick with a chalk on the end, you chalk the tire. That way you knew how long that car had been there. And you go back and when you see that chalk is still there, you give them a ticket. Can't do that anymore. It's considered a seizure. Um, at least the most recent case law uh, considers that a seizure. That's why having that turnover sometimes difficult. And, and it, again, we know what the problem is. It, it, we've talked to businesses. We've tried to create avenues for them to have off-site parking. But people default, default to human nature, right? If I can park two miles over there and have to walk to work for the next eight hours, or I can park right there, I'm going to park right there. But that's the problem. This is this was before we did this whole parking analysis. We had anecdotal information that told us that was what the and even as recently as last week, talking to one of the CSOs who had an argument, uh, had a had a business owner come out and give her a hard time about a ticket that she gave to one of the employees. It was an employee that was parked right there all day in front of the business. It was it was a the, it was what we know to be true. It's this is the issue. Um, Again, I know it's not a popular decision in all, all avenues, but I do think that's part of the solution, that there needs to be some type of paid parking. There needs to be something that moves, that turns that over, not in a punitive sense, but you know, when I go to Margaritas or I go someplace with my family, I'll park in the Mystic Art Association, I'll have dinner. They validate my parking. When I go back out, I can go to the kiosk and it doesn't cost me anything, but I've, I've done it the right way. Um, We've had those conversations with business owners, but we know what the problem is. And, and, and why that relates to noise is because of what I said earlier, excuse me. Those are folks, now we're pushing people into the neighborhoods. We're pushing traffic into the neighborhoods. I get a lot of complaints, you know, you name a, you name a, a, a small street in downtown Mystic Homes, you know, all those small streets are, they do send us complaints. And, and we want to do enforcement, but here's the secret with enforcement. You got to be able to do it safely. You've got to be able to set a cruiser up to do that enforcement where they can they can not only see the cars coming to, to, to use radar or to use their own personal observations, but then you have to have a safe place to stop them. And those, those roads really aren't conducive to that. So the reason it relates to noise is you increase traffic, you get that people driving around downtown Mystic looking for a spot, speeding through the roads, or if they do find a spot that's farther out, they have to walk. And at that 1.30, 2 o'clock, when they've maybe had a couple too many beers and we want our officers out there enforcing the OUI laws, you know, they may be walking back to the cars, having a conversation like I'm having with you right now, that's heard all over the neighborhood because the sound is carrying, the noise is louder. And in, in the noise ordinance specific to that, how are we gonna detect that? How would this fix it? it? It wouldn't, because we'd have to have an officer run out there, gauge the noise of people talking at that particular time, as opposed to if we were able to identify the people, if, the, if it's, if it's suitable, if it's necessary, give them an infraction for creating a public disturbance because they fit the statutory definition of it. We, we can utilize that. Just to follow up, the, the, the number of citations for public disturbance, sure. have those been increasing and, and do, how many of those are issued? Um, I don't have that number for you right now, okay. but I can get it. But that, yes, we do, we do uh, relatively frequently, it, although not every time we go to a disturbance or not every time we get a noise complaint do we issue an infraction. You know, most of the time it's, especially if it's a business, and that's another one of the conflicts that, that, that was pointed out by one of the lieutenants is, who do you issue it to? If you get called to Joe's Bar and Grill in downtown Mystic, and they've got a band playing, and the band is too loud, do you issue it to the manager? Do you issue it to the, do you issue it to both? You know, what's the right, you know, how do you handle that? And, and in the past, we've We've navigated those channels with the state infraction for creating a public disturbance, but it does create some of that, that conflict. But I don't have the number, um, uh, but I can, I can get that. I can yeah, get that's fine. Maybe that's just an area that if there were more disturbance, more citations for those, if those are, because those are the concerns I'm hearing. So, so if there were the more time, issued, would that sure. prevent, you know, preventive maintenance on, on yeah, the issue? Most of the time we get voluntary compliance, right? If the, the first response isn't typically, <clears throat> and Rich, maybe you can speak to this, isn't, 
you know, we'll send it, we got a complaint. Hey, go to Joe's Bar and Grill because there's a lot of noise coming in there. Officers will go, hey, turn it down. If I have to come back here, you get an infraction. Or I'm gonna, I'm gonna, and, and usually that does the trick. It does. That's usually, and like I said earlier, it's usually the, you know, having that frank conversation, you know, and, and not an aggressive approach, but like, hey, we understand you're running a business, but you're at that point, you know, people live around here. And, and usually they would understand. But there have been times when we come back and, you know, maybe the manager's not on duty, whatever it is, and people have taken it upon themselves to just say, whatever, we're just going to keep the music cranking. And, you know, we do the, the infraction or whatever, you know, necessary step. Um, but we've had those discussions, and I know I've had personally, and just having that approach and, and being able to talk, you know, it's just like anything. If, you know, neighbors are fighting, I would always say, did you talk to your neighbor before calling me? You know, so we have those conversations one on one, <clears throat> excuse me. And I think a lot of officers, uh, that's their go to their first approach is just to have those discussions and be like, hey, you know, we're at that point. So but I but I think and and where I'm not downplaying at all with what, what you're proposing is because I get it. It's been going on. You know, it's it's downtown mystic. It, it, it gets up there sometimes. So we understand. But I think with our approach and our common sense approach to it, I, I think, um, you know, that is a tool we can use and the chief can attest to those numbers, I guess, at some point. But I think um, a lot of times it just doesn't, it's, that's usually not necessary. They usually just say, sure. And that may give you a bit of a false number too, because some of those things aren't reported. So just take, for example, a couple of people come outside of Joe's bar and grill and maybe one of them's been overserved and he's being a little loud and maybe a little, has some, a little bit of liquid courage and is trying to just be boisterous and an officer goes up and, and I've heard it in so many different venues in the last several years, the officer's job is to de-escalate, right? He's going to try and calm that person down. Issuing a citation right at that time probably isn't gonna achieve that. If he achieved the ends that he wanted, which, hey, uh, hey uh, come on, time to go home. His buddy takes him along and that, that problem has resolved itself. That's not a person that we're gonna have to take into custody. It's not a person that we're gonna have to issue a summons to. And, you know, if they if we start going down that road, do they get more belligerent? Does it become something more than just an infraction? We've created a solution to that problem that doesn't necessitate the issuance of anything. It solves the problem. And that person goes home, goes to bed, the officer goes on their patrol duties, and, and hopefully it resolves a situation that never ends up in, in, in the form of an infraction. That's almost it. Thank you. All right, thank you. Councilor Jones. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor, and thank you, Chief, very much for your, your presentation and your thoughts on this. Um, can you just, I have just a, several questions. One is, um, what does the public disturbance citation mean? I don't, what happens after, if you're issued one of those? It, it, it's, it's essentially, um, uh, not that this would happen, but if you were stopped on your way home from work by a police officer and given a speeding ticket or going through a stop sign, it's the exact same thing. It's, a, it's an infraction. It's a, it's a ticket, um, which so, requires... So is there a, a yeah, penalty a or a fee or something, a fine? Yeah, it's a fine. It's a hundred, I think right now it's $107. I, the last time I checked, I think it was $107. Um, that goes to the state centralized infractions bureau uh, person. If they don't want to pay the fine, they're able to plead not guilty. They could get their day in court. If they pay the fine, they pay the fine. If they don't do either one of them, a warrant could be issued for failure to pay or plead, which is an arrest warrant. That's that's now now it's gone from an infraction to an arrestable offense. There'll be a warrant issued for their arrest. So we can go up. Yes. Is it a, a pretty effective tool? I mean, I know I like the approach that you've been talking about where you just sort of calm somebody down, send them home, you don't need to escalate it, but is it a, an effective tool that you have used? Um, does it do its job when it's needed to be used? In my experience, it has been. I, I'll ask you to comment on that too. Yeah, and I think we touched upon that. I, th I think it is uh, a, a valuable tool, but it also, you know, it, it you also want to sustain these relationships. So again, I think that initial contact, that initial conversation um, needs to be had, but you know, there are instances where that, that is a viable tool. Um, I just know for, as the chief said, when we deescalate, when we try to find the, the best possible solution for everybody, because, and not because we're afraid of the work, but officers don't want to punish people. And you know, that's not, our job is to fix that problem, fix whatever that problem is. Our job is not to punish people. Our job is to enforce the law and to make our, you know, our streets safer and, and make the community a, a better place to live in. So when you come at it with that 
approach, you can say, hey, you know, do we really need to do an infraction at this point? Can we have an open dialogue and say, and, and I'm not saying it's an hour long dialogue, but just say, hey, you know, this is something, this is turning into an issue. We need to address this. I'd rather not give you an infraction. I don't want to create that bitter, you know, um, confrontation. I don't want it to be us and them. I want us to be, we're part of the community too. And when we're out there and we're having these discussions, a lot of times we don't want to do that infraction, but there has to be, if that's not stopping and it continues, then that is, it is something that we can do, but it's, you know, typically our guys don't want to go out and just punish people just because they can. It's, that's, you know, our first, first directive or our first, uh, mission is to go out there and, and create a dialogue, de-escalate, and just see if we can work together on something like that. And that usually, most of the time, works. And I, I you know, I don't, it, it is a tool, like I said, but it doesn't get used as often as you'd think. And I don't, I don't think it's as necessary as, as you'd think. Can I ask a follow-up to that? So let's say you go out there, give them, you know, talk with them, they turn the music down, you get another call, you go out and ticket them, and then they turn the music down, but what if you get another call? Can you tick it more than once at night if they keep on persisting? Could you keep on ticketing? Yeah. 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 Or, or you could go for a misdemeanor, which is not a ticket, which is a, is a charge. You could give them a, cita a misdemeanor summons for creating a uh, for a breach of peace or distor uh, disorderly conduct, or you could make an in-custody arrest, depending on what that consists of. And, and Councilor Jones, just to be clear, so you wonder, you know, there is no mechanism for us to adjudicate this in town. So even on a town ordinance, it doesn't get settled here. It doesn't, there's no, there's no judge in town hall that, that does this. It goes to the superior court. So all these town ordinances, whether it's in Groton or Hartford or New Haven, those town ordinances are adjudicated in, in, in state court under the town's ordinance, which is codified in a law that allows that to make its way into the state system but it's not a state law. So the prosecutors are gonna to have to base their judgment on testimony of the officers. Our officers don't usually have to go testify for infractions because their are laws on the books on state statute. These are not, these are things that are, you know, they're, they're written by attorneys, right? They're passed by a legislative body. Um, but it's, it's, it's different than going into state court on a state citation, a state violation. It's, Depending on the so coach. if you so I guess what I'm what I'm gathering here is that let's say a business didn't turn down his music and you issued one of these uh, a, a citation mm -hmm. is the officer writing a full report at that time so sure. later on when it does go to yeah. the state court I mean they don't know what the noise was or even how it was I mean how do they know is it from the officer's own recollection or is he writing a report he's, he's writing the report we also have body camera footage now I mean that's helpful there's He's, you know, based on his own personal observations or maybe the statement of a person that gave it to him. You know, if it was a neighbor saying, I've, I've had it, you know, Joe's Bar and Grill, every night they've got a band. I've just had enough. It, tonight they're loud. Here's, I want you to listen to this. The officer responds. They make, the, they make their own independent observations or they take a statement from the person making the complaint. That's all submitted as evidence. It's all stuff that, that's going to be used as the basis of meeting the elements of the crime. And, uh, and maybe this is... Um Mr. Burt, maybe you can answer this question. The document that we had in our packet, which is sort of a sample or noise ordinance, where did that come from? Is that from the 2018 efforts or is it something new? That was from the 2018 effort. Um, you know, there, there's a lot of these ordinances are very similar. So I think we basically took a template that we saw other towns used. Okay. Um, Chief, can you just Give a little example. I noticed in this ordinance it says, you know, residential 55 decibels, nighttime 45 decibels. Can you just give an example of what 55 decibels is? Is it a car horn or is it somebody drunk I, I, coming I, out of a I bar? Have, what, what? I may not be the right person to answer that. I, my wife says I have selective hearing. I'm not sure what she means by that. But I, I take it to mean that sometimes I don't, I, I really don't know. I don't know what that 55 decibels equates to. I know that there's, you know, the, the one antidotal thing I've gotten here from one of our um, our uh, uh, lieutenants, he says, you know, daytime 55 decibels is equivalent to a, f a refrigerator or moderate rainfall. I assume that based on what his research was, that that's true. I, I don't really know what that correlates to. And uh, again, that would have to be part of the training. It would have to be part of the, the calibration of the device that we utilize. Um, yeah, I think it's, there's, it seems like there's an awful lot of judgment that goes on in something like this that I know at nighttime sound carries a long ways and, you know, we're certainly not going around measuring the refrigerators. 
um, for their noise at nighttime. So, I mean, it may be car alarm that doesn't shut off or a band that doesn't stop playing, but sure. it seems like there's a lot, of, a lot of judgment that has to go on in trying to determine what is at certain levels at that time. And if it's not going, then like nobody knows what it is. Well, it's, it's that legal phrase, you know, I know when I see it, right? It's, you know, as they, as was once quoted, uh, you know, if it's, if it's excessive noise, depends on the time of day, you know, are we going to get into the point where, you know, your neighbor's having a swimming pool put in, so you got an excavator out there, and you don't like the fact that he's having a swimming pool put in, so you're going to call and say, yeah, this you know, it's over the decibel level. Um, um, I, I guess my, my comment on all this is I, I really like what you're doing in the direction that you've been going with the community policing. I think that's it's very positive. You, you made a direction for our force to do that. You spent a lot of effort on it. We have social workers and people to help with that. It seems to be a, the general theory or, or attitude of how you run, you know, the Groton Police Department, which I think is commendable, and I like that direction. Um, is there any tool that you would like to have in that direction that you don't have in the moment that would help you with noise things or other things? It's a good question. I wasn't prepared to answer that. I would have come up with a bunch of things that. Yeah. Uh, um, I mean, this is just sort of, a, ask, you know, right? sort of a thing that gets slapped on. Um, but I'm just that's wondering: is there is there something missing that you guys, when you're talking about things we'd love to have, that maybe we you need that instead of this, or just I mean, just something to think about. You don't have to answer it right now. No, I don't know. It's, uh, I, and I'm trying to give that some thought because, you know, we do want to impact these problems. We do want to, you know, uh, no, listen, I, I think our community policing program is on the right track. You know, enhancing that is always great, but we, we balance that with doing the other stuff that we need to do. Um, and if I, I'm sure. sorry, and Councilor, and you had, <clears throat> you had mentioned, you know, do our officers do reports on this? I just want to touch on that too because when we have a history, and, and a lot of times that's, you know, uh, we can talk to our dispatchers and say, you know, we've talked to this bar. Yeah, we were just there last night. We talked to them three times. Or, you know, we do that as officers. We see uh, that behavior or those behaviors and we follow up on that. Is there any history there? I can go in there and look at the previous officers, what they discussed with that manager or with the bar owner or whoever, you know, the employees and say, okay, we've talked to these people this many times. Now it's time, hey, let's get our community policing um, folks together let's meet with this manager or this business and say hey you know this is becoming an issue and you know I I would like to that was an interesting question is what you know what tools could we use um, but I I will say it's just that that constant follow-up with our officers knowing that history that's happening at that specific bar or even at that specific neighborhood we've had neighbors go at each other turn speakers towards each other yeah. and you know attack each other with noise because they knew there wasn't an ordinance well guess what we had other avenues which we've discussed so and we we did that so i think knowing the history and if we have to keep going to these repeat you know locations that's a tool we have too and we can articulate that hey you know even in in our infraction or our summons whatever step we take if it goes to that point we can say look we've been here this date this date this date this date warning 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 okay here we are so i think Again, you know, and we've talked about it, and I, you know, the, the um, noise ordinance, you know, we understand why that's being asked, but I think if we do our due diligence and we follow up, do our follow-ups, and we look at the history at some of these places, being able to articulate those things and say, look, we've done all we can, we tried to do the best we can, now we're at that point, okay, guess what, it's time for an infraction, summons, whatever. So I think that's, that's probably, and, and coming from, some of my experiences as CPO, I think that's one of the better approaches we can do when you have that history and you can articulate it. And, and just to be clear, I, we, we won't. No, go ahead. I'm sorry, Chief. I'm sorry. Whatever, whatever happens, whatever, whether there's an ordinance or not, we, I don't want to give a false sense of hope that we will eliminate any problem. We don't, you know, we will not eliminate the fact that there'll be noise complaints at some point in the future, regardless of what happens, whether it's an infraction under state statute. There, there will still be some, but our job is to try and minimize that and to have a positive impact and work. Uh, you know, the great points that Sergeant Sawyer brought up that I think he's right on the money with, you know, we don't want to, we don't want to create conflict between neighbors. We want to make sure that we enhance the business environment, but we want to do that in a measured way and work with other entities, both town staff, 
and uh, and outside organizations to make sure that we educate people that, you know, if they violate this, they, they may get a base on balls the first time, but if there's a history of it, we're going to try and address that. And we've done that with, with varied success. We've done that with some businesses that we had chronic complaints with for a long time that we no longer get complaints with uh, from the, the neighborhoods. But we've had other places that we've had issues with for a long time, and we've undertaken some other actions in concert with the town manager's office and and, uh, and maybe some, some legal representatives from time to time. Okay, all right, I, I just, I guess my final comment is I'm in favor of what you are currently doing and the, at the way that you're approaching community policing. I'm not in favor of a, of a noise ordinance. And I think, I, I, you know, if you need more tools, let us know and we'll try to support that um, to give you the tools you need to do the job. But I like what you're doing in the direction that you're doing it. So thank you. And the it wasn't the only tools and I've said it and I, I know it comes to, with, I, I really hope the council will seriously consider doing something about the parking issue. We've been talking about it far too long that, that, you know, I know it doesn't directly talk to the noise, but that's one of those tools that I'm hoping you will at least consider and, and talk about and discuss. Thank you, Councilor Bordelon. Uh, thanks. Yeah, the parking, um, you know, I see Stonington voted again and they did not pass. So it's kind of, you know, leaves me kind of just there, uh, you know, hard to make a decision when we don't have the joint effort. So it's kind of like, kind of put on the back burner until something else resurrects again for me. I mean, I think it definitely, it has to be a collaborative effort. Um, but with that, um, you know, a person who grew up right up the street from downtown, I mean, I think we got what we, we hoped for, right? We wanted, <laughs> We wanted economic development, sure. and with that economic development comes other entities, um, some not so good, and some that we want. And, and 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 I think it's a process, you know. And so, like I've been digging around and looking, like with towns I'm familiar with, like Portsmouth and Cape Cod, and different things, and and it all comes down to money, of course, too. So one thing that I looked at is like you, know, you stated that some cop, you know officers have to be pulled off, um, maybe on those busy nights like Friday, Saturday nights in the summer. And I personally went down there and tried to stay up as late as I could so I could see what was going on. I, you know, tried to stay, you know, go down. One night I left around 11 to get down there. And um, I don't think it, the problems have even begun at 11. Yeah, yeah. Well, I left at 11 to be out for a little while. And, you know, and walk down some of the side roads and stuff. And I think that, you know, I agree, the park walking further. And, and, and some of the stuff that's in here, the noise ordinance with the sound, it's hard to enforce something like that too because if you put a decimal on it, it's going to be very loud to someone when the houses are this close versus what's the spacing, you know. So it gets to be very tough. Um, but I do think that maybe there's some community policing type of stuff where we maybe call a meeting to the managers down there and say, what number do you want us to call when we hit that level? You know, um, and that's some of the things I found online that these town meetings, they were you know, saying they had a list of like, they, this business, Joe's Bar and Grill says, call Joe. I don't care what time. Or and if you don't get a hold of Joe, call Mary. They had their direct thing. Others had to increase their infractions. For example, if you're paying $300 for a van, $100 infractions, kind of not a lot to a really thriving business. Not that I'm trying to increase revenue, for, um, decrease revenue for them, but maybe for a personal infraction, if I'm out there, you know, having fun, ooh, Porsche, $107, personal. But maybe on a business, it might be first offense is 107. But if you came back out there that night, should it double? I don't know. These are things, maybe without enforcing an ordinance, just things that I was digging around and I was just seeing what other people were doing or some of it hasn't got passed yet. It was just ideas and stuff. But there might be a way that um, we could collaboratively work and say, great, we've increased, great economic driver, but how can we do this? We have to remember that people that are coming into Mystic aren't from here. So they're used to having a good time in Cape Cod and you know different areas where they're allowed to do what they're doing. Um, and I'll take my second turn and talk. But just, I was trying to think outside the box of like what things could we try. And thank you. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll talk at my next turn. Council Franco. Thank you. If you just put me down. So I was on the 2018 council at that time when we had this full discussion. And not to diminish the issue, but I am not hearing an increase in noise complaints. Um, as what you've said, I have heard a change in which business the complaints seem to be coming from or the area that they seem to be coming from. Um, and as you said, it used to be one business took care of the issue. I haven't heard complaints about that one place. Now it seems to be another place um, or an area. 
Um, so my question, I have a few questions here. Let me start with, um, can the PD enforce zoning enforcement regulations? No. So if the noise is after a certain time that's notated in the zoning, or they're using um, a deck after hours, which is in the zoning, or they're having a band, which is in the zoning, how do you, how do you handle this because it's a zoning regulation? It's, it's not something that we enforce. That's a zoning officer. That's a so civil the loudness, action. The, the yeah. loudness would be. No, I'm asking just the zoning yeah. regulation is being violated. No, we typically don't enforce any zoning. The noise, as Tom Andrew was pointing out, that could rise to a level like if it's if they if if there's no, a zoning that regulation part. that says. I'm just trying to stick yep. specifically on the zoning regulations, not the noise. I understand the noise part. I'm asking the zoning regulation. No, we don't enforce zoning. That so if there's a zoning uh, regulation that says you have to do you have to close your deck by 10 o'clock or you have to turn off the band at 10 o'clock. We don't enforce that. There's no mechanism. We, we, you know, we'll, we're partners with zoning, right? We'll go in and say, hey, there's an ordinance here, you got, or there's a zoning regulation that says you got to shut this down. But the zoning enforcement officer is the person that handles that. So any of those zoning regulations are not, they're not criminal violations. They're not things that we do. But we do work with, you know, uh, town zoning officials. Mm -hmm. And many times they'll go out with us. We'll, we'll, you know, accompany us to calls. But we, we don't have the authority to enforce zoning regulations. Thank you. And as you said, some of this is zoning issues. Yes. Um, so if there was an ordinance to be created, would you use sound meters? Is that how you would? We would have to. Would have and to. you had mentioned calibration, certification, and can you go in a little bit about that? Yeah, it, like anything that we do, it would be an increase in training. We'd have to identify officers to do that. We'd have to make sure that we get whatever the training is required. And I don't know what all that training consists of. I just know some of the research that we've got here would be, you know, the purchase of the equipment would be several thousands of dollars. It would have to be calibrated annually. It's just like a radar set. When you issue someone a ticket with a radar set, you, you know, when I was brand new, you'd have to get the tuning forks out, hit the tuning forks at the beginning of your shift, make sure it's working. You know, everything you wrote that, that shift, you'd have to get the tuning forks out at the bit, end of the shift to make sure that it was still calibrated. Every six months, we'd have to send it out for calibration like we do now with our laser sets and radars. It would have to go to a independent organization that makes sure it's certified and within tolerances. Um, again, cost for, you know, officers to be trained in that, you know, potentially over, over time. And I do think, as I was talking with Councilor Jones before, we're not doing it under a state statute. We're doing it under a town ordinance. So the officer's going to have to go testify to that, right? Why did you issue the infraction to Joe's Bar and Grill? Well, here's why, here's the stuff, explain that. And it may or may not be a prosecutor that's familiar with this. So it, the onus would be on that officer in the town to really push forward as to why this was a violation of that town ordinance. And then it's prosecutorial discretion if the prosecutor wants to move forward with it or not. All right, and um, has the state or the state's attorney have any opinion on sound meters, do you know? Uh, I have not had that conversation. I don't know that they would I, I, I don't want to speak for the state's attorney's office. They're, they're certainly not under my purview. They, they're an independent organization that would have to decide whether it's something that they support or not. So I do have, I had a neighbor down the street on a cross street who had a noise ordinance issue and um, was be it was done intentional. It was intentionally done to aggravate a neighbor. Sure. And um, they were brought up on, and I believe they are actually eventually arrested for this continued repeated problem that that was going on there. And it was taken care of without a noise ordinance and it was um, given infractions and, and whatever it was that was issued to this gentleman and was taken care of. Um, it stopped. Um, so if there is so can you tell me more about the disorderly conduct or the breach of peace and how you can enforce that in relation to a business, let's just say, that is being very loud and you can't pick out which person it is that's being the loudest, basically? There's a couple of different ways. I mean, that's a state statute, again, 53A, 181, 182. You know, there's, there's elements of the crime, so we have to make sure each one of those elements of the statutory definition of breach of peace that are involved in that statute. What you know what hits if it's something you know the easy one is there's a fight inside the bar right that's that's a breach of peace could be an assault 
easily to make an arrest on that. An officer may make a, an on-the-spot arrest. If there's something that may be more questionable, they have to gather more facts, they have to get more information to say, okay, here's, here's the elements of the crime. You know, um, it, it, maybe it's beyond the typical, maybe it's a chronic problem, maybe kind of like what you're talking about. Officer could draft an arrest warrant affidavit, bring it to the, the state's attorney's office, have it reviewed, prosecutor sign it, bring it to a judge, and all of a sudden it becomes an arrest warrant. And that, that's a little, a little bit more homework, a little bit more work in doing that. Can it be done? Absolutely. There's also the mechanisms to issue a summons right at the scene. It's, all, it's, it's dependent on the facts that, that are unique to that particular situation. If it's, if it's something that happens right now and it's something we can articulate, violates the statute, we can make an arrest on the spot. If it's something that takes place over a long period of time, probably do a warrant. And it may be something, if it's that complex, we would want that reviewed by the prosecutor and have a judge uh, eventually fix their signature saying that, yes, there's probable cause for arrest in this. And if it's a business that's repeatedly breaking, like very loud noise, or, like very loud in the sure. evening and creating disturbances, um, is it possible for the town to, to send letters and repeatedly tell them, you, I'm getting, we're getting numerous calls on this, and you know, and let the owner of the business be aware and then what the next steps will be. Sure, yeah, and, and just like Sergeant Sawyer was saying before, we, that's something that we can and have done, and it may be something that when we develop that track record, we've gone to Joe's Bar and Grill 15 times in the last two months, and these are the types of things that have happened here. We've had a fight, we've had, you know, we've had uh, you know, car crash or the DUI operator leaving the establishment. We've had, we can put those things together and we can work with the town manager's office and through the town manager's office with the town attorney's office to say, hey, maybe we need to pursue other remedies through the court system to, to, to do this. Not, not necessarily a criminal arrest. There's other avenues that you know, I would defer to legal counsel on to say, hey, can you guide us down that path to maybe us doing something a little bit different? Because it's not, it's not an acute problem. It's a chronic problem. And we need to address the root cause of that problem. That's correct. And I also have issues that this could be weaponized as a neighbor dispute issue. And you would, just the amount of calls that would come from this just trying to get back at somebody would be enormous. That, that would be a concern. And that's what we got here. Thank, Thank you. you. Councilor Bordelon. Uh, thanks. Uh, yeah, no, so I guess my question would, would be do you think like maybe it should be tiered? Um, you know, the first time you go down to a business, it's. 107, which is a random number, but, um, and then maybe it's, you know, the second one is, I don't know, double. I think with that, you know, it's hard to do that on an individual, but on a business, you know, where they're, you know, it's supposed to hold, uphold a, a certain, you know, respect for the community as well. That's my first question. My second would be the zoning portion of it would be um, who's reporting to the zoning, right? We talk about like mandated reporting and such and other, other tiers. I guess, how does our town function, you know, if you go down and you're down handling something else and you look up and you see that the rooftop bar is still operating at 1020, how would the zoning officials know that's happening if someone's not reporting it? So that's my, those are my two questions to start with. Like, is there a way that we should have a system where uh, some type of trail is going to them so that then they can follow up on that? And so that's my question. I'll work backwards. So the zoning, we report that to them. If it's brought to our okay. attention, we let them know. And sometimes it comes from me. If I read the, you know, if I come in in the morning and I see an end of shift summary and I say, hey, this is a problem, I'll go, I'll copy them on it. I'll, I'll go to OPDS and I'll go to the zoning enforcement and give them some information. Uh, sometimes it'll come directly from the officer. Sometimes it'll come from neighbors. They'll get calls independently. Uh, I'm not sure what you're referring to with the tier. Are you talking about if there was an, a, if the council yeah, decided guess, to enact uh, a piece of legislation that it would be a tiered approach? Yeah, I guess I'm just trying to understand, like, could it be? I mean, I don't know what our charter, I don't know what anything says, but like $107 for a business is, you know, for a personal person, it's a little bit more, right? So, but for a business with a band <laughs> playing and you have to go back out there, right? You're costing time to send another officer out. So second time you come out, you know, to, does it double? I mean, is there not this to so? No, the, the, it's, a, it's a state statute. It's okay. that, that fine is, is creating a public disturbance and it's updated annually in the infraction schedule. It's set by, uh, it's set by the state, not by, by our action. Um, and again, I, 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 as far as a tiered response, you know, my, my response hasn't changed to my position on this. It's, I, I really feel that the tools that we have are sufficient um, enacting an ordinance, I don't know that would would help much. I think it would, as was pointed yeah. out earlier, 
I think it would create some conflict, some unintended consequences that we weren't expecting. I wasn't saying I was for the ordinance or an, a ordinance. I was just asking questions about what, you know where the 107 comes from and how that trickles down. Yeah, that's, on that's and, the infraction. Yeah, schedule. and the zoning. Who who reports? Do we have a better reporting system for that? Um, I, and I guess you know maybe I think from the community policing side is like maybe going out to all these different bars and saying like who's reaching out to the maybe a database where we keep track and say you know who who do you want us to contact? When we have to head down there. Do you want us to let you know? Because maybe the owner might want to know and they might come down you know and say hey everybody in here well what's going on so is that is that a possible is that something that we can try to do is a community outreach thing and and uh, you know say and some owners might be like no pound sand i don't want to be on that list uh, and they have a right but maybe other people would be like yes please put me on the list and this is how i want to be contacted There's, yes yes and we do that we, as i said before we had a meeting here everybody was invited some people didn't show up but every business that had a liquor permit in the town of Groton was invited to that meeting. Many of them showed, many of them came. We put the ground rules in effect right then. We told them about these problems that we were having last summer and didn't want to repeat it that. We gave them, I stood in this room at the podium and said, we're giving you the recipe for success. Here's the game plan we're playing by. We're pulling back the curtain. There's no secrets here. These are, these are the rules that you have to play by. This is what we're enforcing. We had the liquor commission in here. We had GASP in here. We had a whole host of people. So we, we did that and we followed that up by our community policing efforts making sure that we do educate and, and, and quite frankly, we, we go to the managers when there's a problem, we go to the managers. I've personally met with some of them, many of them, uh, you, not just at that meeting, but out in the field going out and said, hey, we're having a problem, it needs to be addressed. So we're, we're gonna do something about it. We're, we're working towards that. Do you wanna be part of the solution or do you wanna continue being part of the problem? Some of those owners, you're, they don't want, they're, they're investors, they own the business. They wanna generate revenue. Some of them don't live in Groton. Some of them own these businesses. They allow them to operate here, and, and they may be great business owners, great businessmen and women, but their interest is in making money, and they allow the, the business to be operated by the, their, their surrogates, the people that operate that business for them. That, we do have that communication, but sometimes the owners are, you know, we never see them. They don't, may not even live in the state. Yeah. So, My but, last but question. all those efforts we, we put forth on a regular basis. Thank you. My last question would you would be, like, is there any way to set it up where we had a designated officer down there um, on those nights and weekends where it's most busy that wouldn't be pulled, especially during release hours when the bars are op uh, closing or during those times? We, we do. We put officers down there. It may not be the same one every time, and there's scheduling, time off, and and, the, and here's, the, here's the bitter reality of police work. Those, when do those times happen? They're usually Thursday night, Friday night, Saturday, the weekends. Officers don't get Thursday nights, Friday nights, and Saturday nights off all the time, so when they get it, you know, they're probably going to want to spend time with their family. So we, the on-duty officers take care of it. When there's an opportunity to put people off, officers down there as a special assignment, we do that. It's not necessarily the same person all the time, but that's why, you know, having our community policing folks here to kind of create that baseline, to create that common understanding. They're, they're the ones that are there to educate it and to the, uh, uh, educate those, those businesses and residents, but trying to have them down there when we can. We do try and do that, but it's not always the same people, but we do try to have that. And the last yeah, thing, you know, what I, what I got from complaints from people, it's not always the noise, it's a nuisance. It's the defecation, it, it defecating in certain areas. It's, you know, people vomiting and urinating. And, you know, it's it, it's the whole package deal that turns into, you know, a frat party, you know, <laughs> you know, all up and down the road. And, you know, I witnessed some of it, you know, people coming out and puking right on the roadways, like things that you didn't see necessarily before in that capacity. Now you're seeing it as more of a touristy destination. So I, I think what you see in other areas though is more of that presence down there and they're not doing anything they're laughing and talking to people but i just wonder if there's a way we could have more you know chances where they're not being pulled maybe that would just a presence without any thank enforcement you. thank I, you I would, I would hope um yes but you know it may happen you know typically all, people don't do that right in front of a police officer a uniformed officer seeing there we do put undercover people down but if people witness that i hope they call us if there's a disturbance if there's if they're witnessing someone defecating in in, in a public area that they would call us and yeah we can absolutely do something about that but if it, if it's not brought to our attention we can't do anything about it you know we have to know about it and if it's something that we're called we'll respond you know hopefully there's an officer nearby that can take prompt action on that and uh, and, and, and do the right thing but we need Again, getting back to the Pelian principles, we need the public involvement. We need the citizens to help us. And if they do witness things like that, to let us know about it, and we'll do everything that we can to either prevent it or address it when it does happen. Thank you for your comment. Thank you. Any further questions, discussions? 
All right. Seeing none, thank you for the, right. for thank the you. information. Okay. Thank, thank you, everybody. Thank you. All right, so we are on to. Are we giving any kind of direction? It didn't seem like there was much support for it. So I just wanted to confirm which way it was going. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. On to the Pfizer tax appeal. Potential uh, uh, executive session plan. I don't know if the attorneys have anything before. What's that? I don't know if the attorneys want to say anything before. I will make a motion. Uh, I hereby move that the members of the town council, town manager John Burt, attorney Eric Callahan, attorney Rich Cody, finance director Dee Morrison, assessor Mary Gardner, and city of Groton Mayor Keith Hedrick go into executive session pursuant to general statute section 1-206B, strategy and negotiations with respect to pending claims or pending litigation to which the public agency or a member thereof because of the member's conduct as a member of such agency is a party until such litigation or claim has been finally adjudicated or otherwise settled for the purpose of discussing a tax appeal involving Pfizer Incorporated. So move. Second, Franco. Moved by Melendez, seconded by Franco. Uh, point of information. Yeah. Um, I didn't know if the town manager is just going to give a quick overview what, what he can. They declined to do so. I didn't know that. I didn't hear that on the record. All in favor say aye. 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 They declined. Opposed? No. Abstentions? Cares unanimously. Six in favor, zero opposed, zero abstaining. We're in executive session.
All right, call us back to order. I don't know if we're on. There you go. All right. Back next. The council is back from executive session at 11:11. I do. A, I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. Motion to adjourn. Second. Motion to adjourn by Councilor Bordelon. Second by Councilor Franco. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Abstentions. Carries unanimously. Seven in favor. Are we seven? Uh, zero opposed, zero abstaining. We're adjourned at 11-11. Good night. Good night. Good night. <coughs>